Ladies and gentlemen, you are probably wondering why I am smiling from ear to ear right now, and I'm about to tell you. My next guest has taken me two years just to make contact with. Thanks to his brother and his beautiful wife, Kristen, we have finally got him in SRS Studio for an in-person interview. And it's a phenomenal interview. It's packed full of information and inspiration. He grew up in a blue-collar family in Utah, became a real estate mogul at a very young age, which eventually led to the purchase of a very famous ranch outside of Salt Lake City that all of us know as the Skinwalker Ranch. Lots of anomalies and phenomenons happen out there, a ton of UFO activity, an unexplainable, at least at this moment in time, phenomenons. It's one of my favorite interviews of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like the show, please like, comment, and subscribe. Go to Spotify and Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, and we see a lot of you taking our content, turning it into your own content. We made it easy for you. Go in the description. There is a link below full of raw reels that you can edit, Put on your channel, put on your IG, your TikTok, wherever you want, monetize it, make money. All we ask is that you give the Sean Ryan Show the credit that it deserves. Other than that, do whatever you like with it. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome my new friend, Mr. Brandon Fugel, to the Sean Ryan Show. Brandon Fugel, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. It's a we, privilege to be with you. It's an honor to have you sitting across from me. We have been trying to get you in here for over a year, I think, ever since I first heard about Skinwalker Ranch, and and it's finally come to fruition. I can't believe you're sitting here. I'm, I've been just ecstatic about interviewing you for, for a long time, so thank you for coming. Uh, it's it's an honor and uh, glad we could make the time. I'm anxious to to answer any questions and dive into the big picture relative to the investigation and all of the events leading up to what uh, what has driven us to launch what I believe to be the most uh, the most important frontier science effort of its of its kind in the country. It's incredible. You know, I've I've wanted to tap into the to the UFO, UAP, phenomenon type content, subject, whatever you want to call it for a long time. And you and your team or anybody on your team was the was my number one choice because I look at all these people out that are that are putting content out or putting information out, disclosure and stuff, and and you're the only organization that really just backs it with with real science, real experiments, and it's documented. And you know, this is a this is a subject that I mean it's a controversial subject. Right. And and it's hard to it can be hard to wrap your head around this stuff. And so the the way that you guys are bringing this stuff to the to the forefront and the way you're doing it with real science and scientists and experiments is is fascinating. Oh, it is fascinating you. stuff. They're scary topics. I mean, a lot of these these topics are unsettling. A lot of people are understandably uncomfortable being faced with the reality yeah. that that these things are happening in our airspace, happening in our own backyards, and to have scientific rigor and discipline and a multidisciplinary team focused on gathering the data and documenting the reality of the phenomena. Uh, in many cases, for the first time, is it's an honor, but it's a sobering uh, privilege. And I think we're just getting warmed up. I think so, too. Let me give you a quick introduction here. So, <clears throat> chairman of Colliers International, commercial real estate mongol, investor, entrepreneur, visionary, husband, father, boy scout and the owner of the infamous Skimwalker Ranch. Now, Skimwalker Ranch is the most Googled location in the entire world. Or at least the country. 
It's the number one most Googled landmark in the United States. That's uh, according to Travel and Leisure and Google. That is crazy. More UAP, UFO sighting phenomenons happening there than, as far as as far as I know, than anywhere else on the planet. Yeah, for whatever reason, we're seeing the highest level of, or the highest frequency of UFO sightings and paranormal activity centered in this area. For whatever reason, uh, it uh, it has been a hotbed, and this has been going on for decades, if not millennia. And we're fortunate to be picking up the baton and carrying forward in a in a sophisticated and I think a more aggressive fashion. But these uh, these things have been going on for some time, and we're we're finally bringing it to the public's attention, and I think the most dynamic way. Uh, and transparent way. You're doing a hell of a job. And you're also, it turned into a TV series, two different TV series. Skimwalker Ranch is number one on pretty much every distribution channel that it's a, that it's on. And um, But I want to talk to you, after dinner last night, there's a lot of layers to peel back with you. So I'd like to, I'd actually like to get a full life story if you're, you bet. Okay Let's with dive that. dive in. Starting a childhood. Ask me anything. All right. I'll take you up on that. But everybody starts off with a gift on the show. Oh, so heavens. I got you a couple. <laughs> got you a couple <laughs> gifts. Oh, wow. What do we have here? Hey, gummy bears. So those are Vigilance Elite gummy bears. Great. Love Legal it. in all 50 states. We love treats. Um, <laughs> Oh, zingers. And then one uh, of my all American favorite snacks, especially as we're coming back from from other countries, I'm always really relieved to find that we have our our freedom of uh, choice when it comes to um, junk food. Your wife dime jowed, Kristen yeah. dime jowed. Oh, said this that, is great. Said you have a, an addiction to zingers. I love it. And of course, thank you for arming me with my Diet Mountain Dew. Uh, it's, yeah, I drink about one to 100 to 200 ounces of this stuff a day. Um, and if you look at the ingredients, do you know what the, the first two ingredients in Diet Mountain Dew are? I don't. Uh, let me have you read. Let me have you read the first two ingredients if you can. First two ingredients, carbonated water and concentrated orange juice. Water and orange juice. It's part of a healthy lifestyle, Sean. It's... And, uh, uh, your fruit group. Yeah. There you go. It's 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 fuel. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's my form of jet fuel for the day. But no, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, we'll, we will greatly appreciate the gummy bears and the zingers. And uh, you know, there'll be some some typical lonely nights late at the office where I'll probably be breaking these out. Perfect. And then after dinner last night, I know you're a sentimental guy and you have a lot of artifacts and stuff and so after talking to you and your wife Kristen uh, whose grandpa was a was a UDT Navy SEAL in World War II and your grandpa both your grandpas were in World War II I wanted to give you this so this is oh. underwater demolition patch oh thank from you back so in the much day, the wow. very beginning of Frogmen and this is a Naval Special Warfare Command point. wow so Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, service is is an important thing in our family, and I grew up understanding the importance of serving our country, and my grandfathers were incredible examples. And my wife's grandfather was 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 really a trailblazer with with the predecessor to the Navy SEALs. It was the beginning. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, th this means a lot. This will have a cherished place in our collection. Uh, as, you, as you'd mentioned, I love artifacts from history. You know, those, those tangible pieces that, that not only tell our story, but I think illustrate where we've come from and, and hopefully provide a, a bit of a reminder or a roadmap as to where we're going. Yeah, you know, that's Im it's important stuff. They're not teaching it anymore, and they seem to be erasing history yeah. at a record pace. And so it's stuff like this, you know, and, and stuff that's in the studio and stuff that you have. I mean, it's important to pass down to the, to the next generations that are coming up so they know 
where the hell we came from. Yeah, we can never forget. But um, but let's get to you. So where did you grow up? Pleasant Grove, Utah. I'm fifth generation, Pleasant Grove, Utah. My ancestors came from Scandinavia, from Denmark, and immigrated in the 1860s. They were early converts to the the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and settled in this small community at the base of Mount Timpanogos, which is this incredible mountain backdrop in Utah, and lived in a, a small dugout dwelling until they built both the, their, their early home and a blacksmith shop that still stands to this day. So I'm very fortunate to have some incredible ancestors that, uh, that have created a legacy in our community and, and serve as examples. How was your family life growing up? Uh, great. I, uh, I grew up as a child of the 80s. I just turned 50. So uh, as, a, as a child of the 80s, you know, my parents raised us on a steady diet of Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Ridley Scott, James Cameron. You know, I, I, I was a huge fan of everything from Knight Rider to Battlestar Galactica to Star Wars to the A-Team. Uh, you name it. Uh, the pop culture of the period was, uh, was in hyperdrive and was, was alive and well in the Fugel household. But I have uh, three brothers, all boys. My poor mother was outnumbered, and she, she actually flew in with us, accompanied us uh, on this, uh, this oh, trek. Oh, really? Yeah, so she's in, she's in Nashville uh, with my brothers um, doing some sightseeing, but uh, very fortunate to have the greatest parents in the world. I, I hit the lottery, won the lottery when it came to my parents and grandparents and the incredible uh, individuals that they are in the family. My greatest mentor in life uh, was my father, who unfortunately passed away just under two years ago, uh, much younger than he should have uh, Past, but he he was an incredible example to me, and I was raised in this small community that uh, that I continue to live in with my with my wife. We we intend to to die there. So you still you still live in the same place? Where I've you grew lived up. almost my entire life in this uh, small community of Pleasant Grove, Utah, that I love. I've been going to the same gas station, convenience store since I was a little boy. Uh, we. You know, we participate in the same community gatherings and rituals uh, wow. every year and, uh, and have been very fortunate. Uh, Not a lot of people like that left with, uh, with roots like that where they grew up. Yeah, it's small town USA at its best. Um, what kind of stuff were you, what kind of hobbies did you have when you were growing up? You know, growing up. Uh, me and my friends were really close. I had a very close knit group of friends, and we we stay close to this day. In fact, every year, I pull together ten to twelve of my best friends from my youth that I've been friends with since elementary school. We were involved in scouting. In fact, most of us were Eagle Scouts and had that wonderful experience. We were involved in martial arts, uh, karate. I uh, grew up not only on a steady diet of sci-fi and adventure, but also martial arts. Chuck Norris uh, was, a, was a hero uh, of mine, and uh, me and my friends would spend weekends, sleepovers, you know, digesting every ninja and martial arts-oriented movie that you can imagine. Um, and, and we were involved with, with role-playing, with fantasy. We played Dungeons & Dragons, and other role-playing games in our in our youth that uh, that I think uh, had a had an impact not only on the way we we looked at the world but but it forged relationships that uh, that stay intact to this day. I found that the older I get, the most important things that we have in this world are not possessions; they're relationships and experiences. And I've been blessed with an abundance relative to the relationships and experiences. I've had the same best friend since fifth grade. Uh, 
Wow. We talk every week. We're business partners. In fact, he's been on the show. He's been on the docu series as a consulting uh, oncologist, radiologist, as a as an expert. Oh no, kidding! Uh, yeah, Doctor Christopher Lee. So we've been best friends since fifth grade. We got our Eagle Scouts together. We went on our our Mormon missions about the same time. He went to Germany. Speaks fluent German to this day. I went to Hawaii, of all places. Learned how to speak some inappropriate Tongan. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I've been really fortunate. But we were raised, I think, in, a, in an ideal environment as, as, as part of the Reagan era. You know, George Bush Sr., it was, uh, it was the end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, we, we grew up as kids, uh, terrified of, of the potential of, of war uh, and, you know, you grew up on Rocky Four and Red Dawn, and 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 understanding the importance of freedom and our and and our way of life, and we saw the 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 fall of the Berlin Wall occur. I think that occurred during my senior year, uh, where we saw uh, a lot of remarkable things occur. Uh, that. Uh, that has blessed our world and ushered in a new era. You seem to have come from a long line of a patriotic family. And in my research, I read that one of the things that your old man used to say to you damn near every day is, what did you do to make, what did you do today to make your country better? Yep. Have you done any good in the world today? On an almost daily basis, my father would reach out to me and ask, have you done any good? Have you done any good in the world today? What age did that start? You know, from the time I was a teenager, and, and it became even more frequent as I grew older and, and built my own family and went through my own challenges and, uh, and triumphs. Uh, my father's words and am- admonitions stay with me every day. And, and he had an incredible father. My grandfather was a decorated bomber pilot, World War II, flew a Corsair, and was fortunate to be selected to fly over Tokyo Bay when the Japanese surrendered. And, and it was a pivotal moment in the Pacific theater you know, during the war. And... And hearing his stories and seeing his example helped, I think, crystallize those things that are most important, those core principles that, uh, that differentiate our way of life, you know, our people. <clears throat> How did that kind of form you into who you are today? I mean, you... you so. I did a lot of research on you. I've seen some people giving you flack, saying that things have been handed to you, thinking yeah. that you came from a family, from a very wealthy family. Which is a bunch of bullshit. From what yeah, I understand. My dad, yeah, my, my father drove a brown beat-up Pinto when I was in junior high, graduated to a beat-up Astro van when I was in high school. I haven't taken one penny from my, uh, from my parents' I was very fortunate. I, I was able to receive that, which was most important, which was an incredible upbringing and examples. But my father's success didn't didn't really occur until I was an adult and had already established myself in commercial real estate. Uh, it's it it's important to note that it, you know my my father and I were both EY entrepreneurs of the year for the Western Region for completely different. Businesses. Are you serious? Unrelated. That's amazing. Uh, and I think that that still kind of sets us apart. Uh, in 1920, my great grandfather started a construction company that became really one of the largest utility construction firms in the country. But it wasn't without great sacrifice. I mean, during the 80s, they could barely keep the doors open. Uh, they, they were struggling considerably, and to my father and his brother. Guy uh, ended up making some critical bets and risks on fiber optic 
technology, on, on devising methods to be able to install long haul fiber optics underground and, uh, and really took the utility constru construction business into the future. So while, while it is true that our family has been very blessed, uh, I, I didn't grow up with any privilege, grew up in the same 1800 square foot house and, uh, and it was fortunate to be blessed with a work ethic. Uh, my, my dad expected that, that we would work construction as teenagers. And so every year I was shipped out of town to work on construction crews uh, with a shovel in hand. And it was literally a ditch digger uh, for years, but it taught me not only the value of hard work and how to work long 12 to, to 16 hour days, but also to appreciate people from other backgrounds, from other walks of life. You experience all sorts in the construction industry and to be able to, to develop respect for your peers, uh, even, if, even if they've chosen different paths and, and have different approaches to life was, was important. And being part of a team, being part of a crew that is focused on, on you know, a, a very complex uh, set of requirements was was something that uh, that I enjoyed being part of as a as a teenager working heavy construction and so it, it was uh, to everyone's surprise at eighteen that I chose to not pursue a career in the family business in construction but to to forge a path in commercial real estate yeah what what uh what prompted that? What what got you interested in commercial real estate as an 18-year-old kid? Well, in junior high at age 13, I became obsessed with uh, business, with who the captains of industry were. I read a book uh, by Lee Iacocca, uh, Iacocca, the, the great autobiography of the automotive icon, who was really the father of the American Mustang the Ford Mustang, and uh, led Ford into great expansion. And uh, we can thank him for that. We can also curse him for the Chrysler minivan <laughs> and uh, uh, because he ended up uh, bringing forward uh, you know, the, the minivan and, and turning around Chrysler in and, and one of the great uh, automotive business epics of our, of our age. But uh, hearing his story and then moving into high school and having an interest in business, not just who the power players were, but how did they get in the positions of influence that, uh, that they inhabited? I mean, by the time I was a junior and senior in high school, I had my own subscriptions to the Wall Street Journal and Business Week. And as I was nearing the tail end of my senior year in high school as student body president, I was very focused on jumping into a, a career and selecting a career path that would afford me the opportunity to work with the captains of industry, the very people that I was reading about in these journals, in the, the newspapers and the magazines uh, that, were, that were leading business and changing the landscape of our world. And through a comprehensive research effort during my senior year in high school as I was turning 18 years old, I identified commercial real estate as being the ideal career path that would potentially afford me that opportunity to wow. work with the captains of industry. Because if you think about it, if you're in business, you have to have a real estate strategy. Everyone in business, you know, it, regardless of, of what business for the most part, has to at some point have a real estate strategy. And uh, unlike the law you know, or, or banking or other disciplines, uh, I was able to quickly get licensed. You know, at, at age 18, you know, I, I was able to complete all of the, the schooling uh, quickly and, and take the test, the four-hour test, and, and obtain my license uh, to focus on commercial real estate. 
And it was a surprise to everyone. My own parents thought that it was a, an unusual, perhaps foolish path uh, because my, my father wasn't in the real estate business, but I saw it as an opportunity to be involved with the changing landscape of the communities uh, surrounding us and, and the rest is history. So I started off in business at a very young age, at 18. Uh, sold my first office park when I was 19 years old. Wow. And, um, and I built a proprietary database as a teenager tracking all of the inventory and the power players in the market. Uh, I, I would spend hours every day cataloging every building from one end of the market to the other and the companies that occupied spaces in those buildings and who the CEOs, CFOs were, how much square footage they occupied, when their leases were up, did they have an interest in buying in the future, you know, what were their plans for growth, what made them tick. And I, uh, I built that database as, as really a crystal ball that would give me visibility into who would be making moves in the future, who were the most likely companies and entrepreneurs that would be changing the, the landscape of the business community, both figuratively and, and quite literally. You, you were doing that at 19 years uh, old? 18, 18 and 19. And it, uh, it supercharged me. Now, I took a break uh, at, at 19 after spending about 15 months in commercial real estate. I, I elected to go on a, a mission for my church, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and served for two years in Hawaii. But uh, I kept my license active when I entered the mission field, and uh, and a lot of the transactions that I had teed up that were in process or progress uh, before my mission, thankfully came to fruition when I was but a greenie, uh, a, a young missionary at age 19, and uh, it was funny, I, I quickly obtained a brick phone when I entered the mission field, which, which was very unusual. This was 1992, so I'm dating myself here, and, uh, and kept in touch periodically with my office back in Salt Lake uh, to make sure that my, my deals were progressing. And it was funny, I bought my first Armani suit as a Mormon missionary on a bike. Uh, <laughs> I bought it from the the Italian menswear store at uh, Kahala Mall, which was kind of the posh mall uh, right outside of uh, Honolulu at the time, and uh, and it was uh, it was a f it was a fun reward, I guess, uh, to treat me myself to that after selling some buildings and and having those deals come to fruition. So even though I was focused on my my mission and my my missionary service, I was fortunate to see transactions close for a period of time that I had uh, placed under contract before before leaving for Hawaii, which was an unlikely uh, mission call for me. I mean, most of my friends were going to to foreign lands. I mean, whether it be Chile or or Germany uh, or other places, and to to get a call to Hawaii was uh, was quite a surprise for me. So it, it sounds like there was uh, somewhat of a life-changing experience. Changed my entire life. Every day of my life uh, has been influenced by that two-year mission experience that I had. The relationships forged, the lessons learned uh, during that period of time. I mean, that's such a formative time in anyone's life in any young per person's life. You think of what happens between ages 18 or 19 and 21, and that's a period of time where, where you're making decisions as to who you are and how you view the world and, and what kind of person you're going to be. And to be in a position where, you, where I was focused on Jesus Christ and teaching people the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and even just performing service, just helping people. I mean, at the time, uh, the islands were hit by Hurricane Iniki, 
there was a huge hurricane that came in and destroyed uh, a lot of the communities. And that was a heck of a way to start my mission. <laughs> uh, you know, we had you know, power, power lines down, uh, entire living spaces that were, that were flooded as a result, a lot of destruction. And for a period of weeks, we didn't really teach anyone about Jesus Christ. All we cared about was helping people clean up the disaster and the mess. And that service experience uh, was, was really important. It was, uh, it was, I think, Christianity at, it, at its best, to see neighbors coming together, to see communities working together in the face of destruction, in the face of this natural disaster that had taken place, and to to be able to to work to help people dig out of that, you know, with no no thought of compensation. I mean, we're we're just there to help. You know, we're we're there as missionaries without any money, <laughs> yeah, and not looking for any compensation, and and just wanting to roll our sleeves up. And and help, and that was that was an important experience for me. the The whole experience with Hurricane Iniki at the beginning of my mission uh, really set the right tone for the rest of my experience. And I I had a uh, companion at the time. He was my senior companion and my trainer. His name was Brian Arnold. Many people know him as Dragon. He's my head of security. He was down there with you. So. The relationship built with Brian Arnold, otherwise known as Dragon, uh, at Skinwalker Ranch, as my head of security, has has been a a relationship I've had since my mission. He was my my senior companion. That's and, incredible. And we've been dear friends ever since. It didn't start off that way. We hated each other. <laughs> the Why first, is that? The first several weeks uh, of my mission. Uh, we were just at each other's throats. I mean, you, when you're young men and you're thrown into a small little apartment together, you come from different backgrounds and are in, a, in different places emotionally. Uh, it it can be uh, it can be a, a different experience. And uh, at first, we really didn't see eye to eye and didn't get along. Uh, but after a couple of weeks and uh, a fist fight. Where we broke some furniture, we uh, we found common ground, and <laughs> became dear friends, and had some very special experiences, uh, serving, you know, teaching people, and uh, and really learning a lot about ourselves. And so that uh, that friendship has been enduring, and has been an important part of my life. And so when I bought the ranch, when I acquired. Skinwalker Ranch secretly, I needed someone that I could trust that would help run security as we were uh, bringing in dignitaries and scientists and guests to to engage with the investigation. And, you know, he, you know, Dragon had the the background as, a, as an expert marksman, uh, licensed security specialist with the state of Utah, and someone who really loves the outdoors, uh, the environment seemed to be a perfect fit yeah. for him. Plus, he has that that look on his face all the time. I mean, people refer to that look as as uh, as you know, kind of a a uh, a bitch face look. Uh, but he's always had that uh, that demeanor. He's always had that sour look on his face, uh, which I felt uh, was was perfect for someone who would be running security. Yeah, yeah, I could see it. So when you got back from Hawaii, so was, were you an agent broker? Did you own the buildings no, at that broker. age? Or, or? So, yeah, I was merely acting as a broker, bringing together landlords and tenants, buyers and sellers, and uh, facilitating transactions. I, I, mean, I, I think this stuff's fascinating because in today's world, you just hear victimization. You know, it's, it's I can't make it because of this, and I can't do it because of this, and these people are getting in my way, and this 
This yeah. group's keeping me down. And, and, and so to have somebody like you in here who, who, who came from nothing and built yeah. everything you have. There was no hard college work. fund. There was no college fund. It was either we had to go work construction or, or have a scholarship, you know, have grades that would, would allow us to have a scholarship. I was fortunate to have a leadership scholar, scholarship uh, to what is now Utah Valley University, which is the largest institution in the state. But, it, you know, nothing was, was just handed to me. I mean, those things had to be earned. And there was sacrifice required. I made $500 my entire first year of working full-time while going to, to school full-time. I starved to death trying to jump into the commercial real estate business. The sales cycle involved was long and arduous, but also the, the learning curve and being able to, to, to build a platform, you know, to build a career, it takes years. And it's years of sacrifice, years of starvation. And I think all too often people underestimate what kind of sacrifice is required in order to truly succeed. Uh, in order to get extraordinary results, you have to be willing to put forth the extraordinary effort required. Hey everybody, I wanna to talk to you about two products from First Form. One is OptiGreens 50, the other is OptiReds 50. We all know how life can get very busy hectic, it turns into a lot of stress. Next thing you know, a whole month has gone by and you don't even realize it because you've just been going so fast. And when you get in these situations or these, these, these little sections of life that are like that, what's the first thing that always goes to the wayside? Your diet. I'm guilty of it too. My diet goes to complete sh when I'm stressed out, when I'm busy, when life gets hectic. And you know what? The first thing to go for my diet, it's always greens. It's just how it is. I don't know why. It's just always greens. And so I started trying this new product from First Form, Opta Greens 50. These are great. They are processed with low temperature. That way they don't affect the ingredients. There's no synthetic colors, flavors, sweeteners, or preservatives. It's 100% non-GMO and gluten-free. Here's the cool thing. They come in these little travel packets now, right? So you can keep these in the truck, keep them at work, keep them at home, open one up, dump it into a bottle of water, and there's your daily vegetables, greens, whatever you want to call it, intake, right? Then on top of that, they also have Opta Reds 50, which is your daily Reds intake. These are also amazing. They actually taste pretty good too. So. If you're looking to get your diet back on track or at least supplement vegetables and reds and greens when you're busy and you don't have time to cook the way you'd like to, I suggest you try First Form. Check out Opta Greens and Opta Reds 50 from First Form. It can help fill those gaps and give support to your hectic life. Visit firstform.com SRS to get yours today. That's firstform.com SRS to get yours today and get free shipping on orders over $75. That's Opta Greens and Reds 50 from First Form. This mashup is being sponsored by Gold Co. Go to goldco.com slash Ryan for your free investor's kit. Right now, there is this huge push for the digital dollar or the central bank's digital currency, which would in turn make us a cashless society, which probably isn't a good thing. Here's a couple things to consider. When every dollar is gone, that means no extra cash for garage sales, no tooth fairy, no piggy banks. Every penny you spend could all be tracked and controlled. Of course, millions will call it a conspiracy theory, but we know those people always wind up on the wrong side of history as we see in modern history. That's one reason why thousands of Americans are opting out of the system and putting some of their savings into gold and silver. To help you navigate that decision, you can go to goldco.com slash Ryan, or you can call 855-336-0607 
to get a free 2023 Wealth Protection Kit from my new sponsors at Gold Co. This free kit shows you how you can protect your savings with physical gold and silver tax-free and penalty-free. Plus, you'll see how you could get up to $10,000 in free silver just for protecting your savings. So with the possibility of a digital dollar coming, at the very least, you want to be educated about your options. So go to goldco.com slash Ryan or call 855-336-0607 to get their 2023 Wealth Protection Kit. That's goldco.com slash Ryan. Performance may vary. Consult with your tax attorney or financial professional before making an investment decision. And people ask me all of, all the time, well, what is the secret to success? And I think the secret to success in many respects is being willing to do that, which most people aren't willing to, to do. It's, it's sacrifice. It's being willing to persevere in the face of adversity. And, you know, business is, is no different than, you know, the military or, or any other path. I mean, it's, it requires sacrifice, persistence, and and discipline in order to to succeed. And you know, there are, at least in my world, there there's no easy deal. There's no easy path. And uh, you you learn how to sidestep a few landmines and to learn how to efficiently navigate transactions as you grow and mature. But uh, it's it's. It's really not any easier today than it was decades ago. I just have a little bit better arsenal to deploy in service to getting results. It, <clears throat> at what age did you start acquiring your portfolio of real estate? Yeah, my 20s. So I, I, uh, I quickly uh, accelerated my, my success, my... Uh, control of the commercial real estate market in Utah. By the time I was 25, I had more office building listings. I was representing more buildings than anyone, I believe, at the time. And I had the opportunity to launch what was Coldwell Banker Commercial. Uh, Coldwell Banker Commercial was one of the oldest, if not the oldest, commercial real estate brand in the United States. And there had... Uh, there had been an opportunity at that time to to reintroduce the the CBC brand and platform to the market, and so I was I was fortunate to co-found the Coldwell Banker Commercial operation in Utah at age 25, and wow. quickly grow it into the largest commercial real estate firm in uh, in the Intermountain West. Uh, it was it was an incredible uh, opportunity to be able to to leverage the proprietary database, the data-driven approach that had differentiated me early in my career to, to really develop a, uh, a large commercial real estate firm that transformed the market and still continues to lead the Intermountain West under Collier's. Uh, but uh, it, it, it wasn't until my 20s that I finally... Uh, was able to to have the momentum to be able to to take some ownership and diversify in that regard. And you know, I'm very fortunate in that I haven't had to give up my role as a trusted advisor and broker while you know diversifying and having equity and owning uh, real estate. I've been able to. I've been able to have the best of all worlds in my career, thankfully. Some of the developments that I've seen that um, you've that you've developed are, I mean, it's some beautiful architecture. Yeah, it's the largest office parks in in really the Intermountain West, largest mixed use centers that have changed the skylines of the community. And I, I have to tell you, that is the greatest rush to see a tangible manifestation of my labors, to be able to see the impact of my work manifest in the, the workspaces, in the, the shopping uh, malls and, and the, the places that are 
providing employment and the economic development vehicle for our communities to thrive is a is a real privilege. Do you have a do you have a favorite piece? The most unique piece of my portfolio is obviously Skinwalker Ranch, the most scientifically studied paranormal hotspot on the planet. Uh, we'll get to that in a we few will. minutes. Uh, I, uh, I, I am currently master planning uh, over 1,200 acres on the north shore of Oahu in Hawaii, where I serve my mission. In fact, it's, a, it's an incredible agricultural uh, project that is providing the opportunity to return private ownership to the community of these you know, five to 20 acre farm lots that have incredible ocean views and, and the ability to create a true sustainable community. Uh, but uh, in Utah, as far as the office parks and commercial centers, uh, yeah, I have a project called Thanksgiving Park that, that is in the heart of what we now call Silicon Slopes. Uh, almost a million square feet of Class A office space that has been a, an important part of my, my career, uh, putting that project together at its inception all the way through to to success and conclusion has been a, a great privilege, but a, a number of other incredible projects. Uh, Falcon Hill, which is, I think, the finest aerospace research park in the country at Hill Air Force Base, is a uh, noteworthy project that I've had the privilege of being involved in since since the beginning that, uh, that will continue to grow and expand. Uh, but so many mixed use projects. I currently represent projects in 28 municipalities. Oh, wow. Several hundred uh, properties that I, I currently have the privilege of representing, uh, coupled with maintaining my position as chairman and co owner of, of Collier's International's Intermountain Operation. Collier's, who, who I merged with five years ago, is one of the big three global commercial real estate service providers with 65 offices, or excuse me, with over 500 offices in 65 countries oh, wow. and 17,000 professionals. Collier's is truly a global company. And to, to merge my, my previous firm, Coldwell Banker Commercial, with Collier's propelled us to another level and has, has been an exciting evolutionary step in my career. And in tandem with that, you know, to have some of these other more unconventional projects that I've been focusing on uh, has made life very interesting. I'll bet. Let's talk about, let's go back to Hawaii, the Dole Plantation. What's, what is going on with the Dole Plantation? Well, is Dole, this Dole is in Dole Fruit? Yeah, so Dole Foods who uh, started farming uh, the property in, in Hawaii back in the, the mid-1800s, has moved a lot of their farming operations to third world countries, and as a result, has been willing to sell their key pieces of, uh, of property uh, in Hawaii. And I fortunately, not only being familiar with that area, is having lived there for several years and served there as a missionary, uh, saw an opportunity to acquire the property, bring in partners to uh, complete a master plan, and to preserve the cultural and the agricultural focus and history of that area. I mean, in the midst of this property, there is a 350 to 400 acre canyon ranch that has remained unseen by by the general public. It's, it has been uh, a secure part of the overall assemblage and is right out of Jurassic Park or oh, uh, Avatar. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful paradise that, uh, that we look forward to introducing the public to in the future. What, what, do, you, uh, what do you envision? Well, right now we're focusing on the, the agricultural mission and returning private ownership to the local community. And as such, we've, we've been selling five to 20 acre lots for these, uh, these farmers to, to be able to create a, a sustainable experience. And That's to, amazing. 
to to reclaim the land, and it's it has been a lot of fun. All of this property, for the most part, is ocean view, so it looks out over the entire North Shore, and uh, is just just an incredible piece of property and and a fun project uh, to work on in tandem with Skinwalker Ranch and and also leading the uh, the largest office developments in the Intermountain West. I've had a I've had a lot going on. I've had my hands full. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> I and, feel uh, like I'm I'm living about ten lifetimes at once. Yeah. Uh, currently, but it's a, it's a great privilege. It's a high class first world problem, as my dad would always. Hey, say. you know, I I think these stories are kind of like what I was talking about just a couple of minutes ago. I think they're extremely important because it's showing that you don't have to be born into this. It's hard work. No. It's 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 getting your hands dirty. It's it's well, the American dream is alive and well. Yeah, Just look at me. I, I I'm the son of a ditch digger. That's what I'm getting and, at. And uh, and and my dad would would be chuckling right now. He'd be nodding, saying, "Yeah, you're absolutely right." I mean, we're we are uh, we're immigrants that uh, that followed a dream, you know that that came to this country. You know, to to start a life, and only in America do you see the kind of opportunities that that allow people to fulfill their dreams. And I hope that we can keep that that alive. I'm I'm worried about that. I'm worried about our country right now and the forces that seek to undermine freedom, that seek to undermine free capitalist principles that allow people to take risk and be rewarded for taking risks. And I, I hope that we, we see the same opportunities for the generations to come that we've, we've been fortunate to have. I hope so too. There's, um, I'm worried about it too. Yeah. I know there's a lot of us worried about the direction that we're heading in right now. Yeah, it pisses me off. Me too. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty angry about the the state of affairs in this country and I hope that we can find more unity that that's the funny thing is I feel like when all is said and done we really have more in common as we pull people together and we unify you know our communities but yeah. there's so much out there trying to divide us and I uh, I hope that I hope that truth will prevail and that good people will work together to to help uh, our country thrive in the future uh, it, it's it's important i i'm very thankful for the opportunities i've been given i wouldn't be where i'm at without good parents grandparents with without great examples even my my teachers yeah my my high school teachers who had such an impact on me. Our educators don't get anywhere near the praise that they should. In fact, we just went to, we took our, uh, our favorite high school teacher to Mission Impossible this last weekend uh, just to stay in close touch. And the impact that Mr. Blaisdell, who is, who is our favorite teacher, he, was, he taught English and German at Pleasant Grove High School, the impact he has had on our lives and inspiring us to do better, to be better, you know, not only with learning English, but also being better human beings and following his example, uh, that impact and that influence cannot be underestimated. And I think it's important we, we I think it's important that we honor those who are teaching our children that are teaching correct principles and being examples uh, for our community. And so it's, it's, it's fun. What you'll find with me is I, I surround myself primarily with people that have had an impact on me since my youth. You know, my, my best friends, regardless of, you know, what their occupation or their path in life, or even our, even the teachers from my past, still act 
and serve as mentors. And I'm thankful for that. That's amazing. Let's talk about your wife, Kristen. So we had dinner last night, me and my wife and you and Kristen. And, um, you know, I never really know what to expect. And <laughs> and especially with, with somebody like you coming in, it, you never really know, you know, how it's going to go. And both of you are so grounded and just a real pleasure to be around. And, and you complement each other perfectly. When did you guys meet? Yeah, we met a number of years ago. Uh, we've only been married for uh, for almost two years, but we met each other at age 11 and uh, lived in the same neighborhood, grew up together, but went different directions. We didn't date uh, in high school. Uh, I, I, I should have had more courage to ask her out, but she was both too pretty and, and I think she was a little shy and, and I was as well. Uh, but we end up bumping into, into each other later in life. You know, she's a widow. Uh, her first husband died of H1N1, uh, you know, the flu, uh, a number of years ago, and, and left her raising you know, two boys and a daughter and grappling with you know, what, what that meant, the implications of, of being a widow in her early 40s. And, and I've been in a, in a state of transition, was, was married yeah, for decades, but uh, uh, that didn't work out. I mean, life is, is complicated. <laughs> you know, we all like to think when we're, when we're young uh, that it's going to be a linear it's going to be a straight, linear, predictable path, but it isn't. Uh, life throws a lot of curveballs. And I've been fortunate as we, we've met each other a number of years ago, I actually bumped into each other in the lobby of her, uh, of her building where she was working for one of the most prominent law firms in the state that I happened to be working with, that uh, we, uh, we reconnected. And, and I'm fortunate to have a wife that is not only my best friend, and my partner, but someone who shares the same excitement and and shares the same goals and objectives. Uh, it's it's great to have that. I didn't know that that existed. I I was pretty jaded. I didn't think that you could really be married to your best friend, um, and that uh, that that would be possible. But she's been a key key force behind uh, everything business. Skinwalker Ranch and and all of these other efforts and she's uh, she's she's a lot of fun. We I've never laughed so hard in my life and I, I never thought I would find balance at age fifty. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's funny. I, I I really am a a teenager from the eighties stuck in a fifty year old body. Uh, if you if you ever want to figure out kind of what makes me tick or really my world view, just think of me as a 16 year old from the 80s stuck in, in this time frame in a 50 year old body, and that sums it up. Uh, I think it's important to note my friends and I really remind me of the kids on Stranger Things. I don't know if you're familiar with that series on I Netflix, am. but my best friends and I we were 12, 13 years old in the mid eighties at that same time period. And we, we were convinced that there was, there was nefarious activity going on and, you know, under the surface of small town, Pleasant Grove. And, and there were mysteries to be solved. And I remember riding our bikes around town between uh, toilet paper, people, people's homes at night and uh, running down to Seven Eleven to get a, a big gulp or a Slurpee and to watching Watching videos uh, you know, from from the the local video store, uh, we we were really fortunate to to have uh, a world ahead of us that seemed to have no limits. There seemed to be no limiting factors, and I I would say that that still holds true. Our greatest uh, barriers to success are sitting right there in the mirror. I think uh, we hold ourselves back more than more than anyone else. I, you know, the power to take command of one's destiny 
is uh, is right there in the palm of your hand. And so it, back then, I remember anything seemed possible. And I think this this realm, this reality that we live in, is a uh, is a reality where long shots are possible, uh, where dreams can be fulfilled. You look at the heroes of our age, whether it be Michael Jordan, you see his his story played out in that. There's a movie called Air uh, that that shows that his deal, you know, the the deal with between he and Nike that created the Air Jordan. Yeah, um, and and you go down the the list of just incredible uh, examples of triumph over adversity and the fulfillment of dreams and ambition manifest in our world. And it's, it's nothing short of it inspiring. And I think we're just, we're just getting warmed up. I think the opportunities we have before us in this day and age where we all, we all carry around the equivalent of a, a library of Alexandria in our pocket times 10,000, where there really aren't limiting factors, at least so far as long as we preserve and protect our freedoms and our, our, our right to, to be able to succeed and to take risk and be rewarded for that risk. I think keeping that intact, that system intact, is going to be so critical to our success going forward. I mean, our, our uh, ancestors fought for it, died for it, died. Many, so many people died so that we we can enjoy the freedoms we have today. And you're, you're proof of that. I mean, you serving with the Navy SEALs, you're a, you're a hero. You're a patriot. You and your, your crew made it possible that for us to be sitting here right now and having this discussion. I think that reminding people that, that freedom isn't free, that it comes at great cost and we need to to be vigilant is is important. It's more important now than ever. I agree with you. But th- thank you for saying that. You know, with when it comes to, I'm trying to figure out how to piece this together, but last night um, talking with you and Kristen, it seems like a, since you two have been together, a lot of things have come around full circle. One of them being uh, making the world a better place. I know that uh, Kristen, I believe, sits on the board of a nonprofit that is combating sex trafficking. Uh, abuse. And, and that has been a topic that we've been hitting here on the show quite a bit. And so I just, I want to commend you guys, uh, both of you for that. That's amazing work, very important. And, oh. um, and, and if you want to expound on that a little bit. Oh, we, we, we think it's important to give back. We're very passionate about our community. You know, Utah Valley University, where we both went to school, is is dear to us. I think providing scholarship opportunities for single mothers. Her mother was a single mom. She was raised by a single mom, just down the street, in in my neighborhood. And and you know, I was fortunate to have a leadership scholarship that afforded me the opportunity to to go to school in tandem with 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 building my career in commercial real estate at a young age, I think giving to good causes, supporting causes that will help our community and help the next generation succeed and carry that torch forward is, is an important part of our legacy. And we're, we're fortunate to be serving on a lot of, of boards and contributing to a lot of incredible causes. Junior tr- Achievement, um, Supreya, uh, you know, we even work actively with the, the Chambers of Commerce to help support our business community and, and elevate, I think, the, the community's uh, ability to lead not only in, in, our, in our state, but also uh, be recognized as an example of excellence nationwide. It's, it's no coincidence that Utah has continually been recognized as the number one place to do business in the country. Wow. The, the number one economic uh, place 
to to do business. And it's because we have an incredible an incredible environment where the pioneer spirit that was that was brought by our ancestors is still alive and well. That entrepreneurial pioneering spirit that uh, that drives uh, our community forward is is thankfully still alive and well to this day. So, Brandon, what is your involvement with the Sapria Foundation? You know, my wife, Kristen, uh, serves on the advisory board of Sapria, which which really focuses on helping victims of sexual abuse. Uh, it started off it really focused on women and girls who have been the victims of sexual abuse, and now uh, men are also being aided through that effort. But we feel that's an important philanthropic effort and, and something that we are passionate about. Their goal is to end abuse and end it through education and providing a safe place for victims to be able to get the help they need and educating you know the community as to the the challenges that are out there. That's awesome. Are you guys involved in any other yeah, types Ma of charities? Yeah, Maloof Foundation. We're proudly uh, working with them and supporting them. Utah Valley University. What is the what is the previous one? Uh, Maloof Foundation. Also, you know, human trafficking is something that they are 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 focused on eradicating. Uh, Elizabeth Smart, uh, who you know, has an incredible story, sits on their board and as part of their effort, but uh, uh, they do they do great work. And uh, but my wife's work with Sapria is resulting in saving lives. That's amazing. And educating people uh, with a focus on ending sexual abuse. It's uh, like I said, I mentioned before, that's a topic that I made it a point to cover this year and I'm going to continue to cover it. I already have interviews lined up all the way through next year on the topic. And, and I got to tell you, you know, the more I dive into that, the, the more I realize it's, it's not getting any better. Yeah. It's, it's more is coming out on it and it's, it's just, it's a dark, sad, but probably the most important topic that we need to start yeah. discussing today. <clears throat> well, and and providing solutions. Yes, giving people safe safety and and help that are coming out of those inc incredibly difficult situations. Yeah. So we're very proud to be supporting those efforts as well as other philanthropic efforts. It's a key part of our mission. We need more people like you out there doing that. That's amazing. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm just a. My first boss in commercial real estate told me one day. He said, "Don't forget, you're nothing but a glorified pots and pans salesman." <laughs> Let's keep it real. I'm right on. <laughs> and so I've always tried to keep it real. That uh, at the end of the day, I'm just I'm here as a service provider, and. And we're only good at, as good as our next deal. Every day I wake up programmed to feel unemployed. Uh, and, and people ask me, well, haven't you felt great success when you, when you close on the sale of an office park or you put together a new project and close that deal and you, and you close a mega deal? Doesn't that, doesn't that bring a sense of peace and success and gratification? And the, the reality is, the hours following the closure, the successful closure of my largest transactions are the ones where I felt the most anxiety because I realize I am unemployed. You are only as good as your next deal, as your next project. And at the end of the day, no one cares what you did a year ago, two Very years true. ago. It's what have you done today? What are you doing tomorrow? Uh, memories fade, and uh, the ability to constantly uh, reinvent and sharpen the saw, so to speak, is is a key to success in business. Not being complacent. Yeah. You know, the other thing that came full circle, which I didn't uh, learn until last night, is Skinwalker Ranch. So... Kristen was talking about her mother, 
and how she had this infatuation with UAP, UFO <laughs> phenomenon type stuff. And then, and then you come along, you guys get married and I don't, did you already? I already owned the you ranch. You already owned Skinwalker But it ranch. was, a, it was a, it was a happy coincidence that she, she happened to be raised by an experiencer. You know, her mother was, was an experiencer that witnessed a UFO in broad daylight you know, with her, with her brother and shared that experience her entire life with those around her, including her daughter, Kristen, you know, my wife. And so Kristen was already somewhat familiar with the landscape associated with the UFO topic. And to, to hear my disclosure that I had acquired this infamous piece of property that had been the center of gravity for research and investigation dealing with these topics was uh, was a happy realization and and quite interesting, and it has brought things full circle. Um, I would have never imagined uh, if you would have asked me ten years ago, did you, if if I would be in this position today, that I would own uh, a piece of property and be funding to the tunes of millions, if not tens of millions of dollars, you know, private research into documenting the reality of the phenomenon, I, I, would, I would have laughed. I, <laughs> I, I would never have imagined it. And, and frankly, I, I had no desire to reveal my identity as the owner when I purchased the property. I did not want my name associated with these topics or the history associated with the ranch. As, as curious as I was, I was a skeptic. I was an open-minded skeptic that believed that there was a natural prosaic explanation for what had been reported there for decades, if not millennia. And, and it has been an incredible journey to, to go from not just a skeptic, but to zoom right past being a believer to an experiencer. That, that was uh, very unexpected. I'll bet. Well, let's... Um before we dive into Skinwalker Ranch, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll figure out how that even wound up on your radar to begin with. You bet. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a minute since I've done a Bub's Naturals commercial, but it has not been a minute since I've taken the best shit of my entire life. Actually, just knocked one out this morning. It was amazing. And I'm going to give you the secret. You ready? Here's the secret. You want the secret for the best shit of your entire life that you could do, I don't know, every day, maybe multiple times a day. Here's the secret. Bub's Naturals Collagen Peptide says it's good for joints, hair, skin, and nails. I'm surprised they don't put on there. It'll give you the best shit of your entire life. But hey, I get it, right? And you mix that with the Halo Creamer, that's MCT oil. Put these two together, you're gonna have a explosive <laughs> hell of a day. These things are both Whole30 approved, NSF certified, and USDA approved. So there's that on top of that. Hold on, wait, there's more. If that doesn't get you going, which I guarantee you it will, You've got Bub's new coffee. So this is the first ever coffee bean Whole30 approved, if you can believe that. And we all know coffee can, you know, speed things up a little bit in the morning. But hold on, wait, there's more. Apple cider vinegar gummies. Guys, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know exactly what these things do for you, but uh, here it says, Promotes energy, immune support, promotes healthy digestion, and supports healthy metabolism. I can tell you one thing. Good luck just eating one of these things because at the end of the night, I will crush an entire bottle of these. That will not give you the best shit of your life. I wouldn't recommend it. It will speed things up, but you may not like the final outcome. And hold on, wait. There's more. There's more. Bubs came out with a lot of new products. They have these hydrate or die 
hydration packets, great for post-workout. All this stuff is great for post-workout, especially the uh, collagen protein. Guys, here's another thing about Bubs. Bubs is a tribute company. It's named after Glenn Bubs Doherty, who was a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor. He died defending our freedom in Benghazi, and Bubs donates a portion of every order to the Glenn Doherty Foundation, and they donate 100% of the proceeds from their products on Veterans Day every year. I love this company. They are just solid people with a solid product, and they just want everybody to experience the best shit of your life. Go to bubsnaturals.com, use the promo code SEAN for 20% off, and let's get it going. I want to give a big thank you out right now to all the Vigilance Elite patrons out there that are watching the show right now. Just want to say thank you guys. You are our top supporters and you're what makes this show actually happen. If you're not on Vigilance Elite Patreon, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in there. So, we do a little bit of everything. There's plenty of behind the scenes content from the actual Sean Ryan show. On top of that, basically what I do is I take a lot of the questions that I get from you guys or the patrons and then I turn them into videos. So we get, right now there's a lot of concern about self-defense, home defense, crimes on the rise all throughout the country, actually all throughout the world. And so we talk about everything from how to prep your home, how to clear your home, how to get familiar with a firearm, both rifle and pistol for beginners and advanced. We talk about mindset. We talk about defensive driving. We have an end of the month live chat that I'm on at the end of every month where we can talk about whatever topics you guys have. It's actually done on Zoom. You might enjoy it. Check it out. And if Zoom's not your thing or you don't like live chats, like I said, there's a library of well over a hundred videos on where to start with prepping, all the firearm stuff, pretty much anything you can think of. It's on there. So anyways, go to www.patreon.com slash Vigilance Elite or just go in the link in the description. It'll take you right there. And if you don't want to and you just want to continue to watch the show, that's fine too. I appreciate it either way. Love you all. Let's get back to the show. Thank you. All right, Brandon, we're back from the break, and now we're getting to what I've really been dying to talk to you about, Skimwalker Ranch. I mean, I found Skimwalker Ranch from a buddy of mine that I used to work with at CIA. He passed me the program, and, and I dove in, and I, I was just, I've been infatuated with it ever since. And there's just, there's so much going on there. You have cattle mutilations, you have radiation spikes, you have more UAP, UFO activity than, than anywhere else I've ever heard of. Yeah. You have all these, these weird injuries happening to people that out there. I mean, how did this, how did this branch ever even wind up on your radar? <laughs> well, it's an unlikely story. Uh, but about 13 years ago, I was funding an advanced physics effort. Uh, we'd actually transformed a, a large percentage of our of our hangar facility, of our family's aviation uh, management and hangar facility at the Provo Airport into an engineering lab testing physics theories dealing with gravitational physics. Uh, it was an interesting effort, was something I did not publicize, and we ultimately, using scientific rigor and discipline, disproved the uh, the core claims and the theories that were being advanced, but through that effort, what, hold on, what got you interested in that? Yeah, it was a former client. So I had a a client that I represented back in the mid '90s that was a a genius software development executive that ended up forming a a company that became the world's leading internet consulting firm. And he, he left that firm ultimately 
uh, to fund efforts relative to the UFO phenomena. Uh, he had claimed that he had his own experience, had been visited. I found it all to be quite unbelievable, but I could not uh, deny his success in business. I'd had the privilege of negotiating his first headquarters transaction and, uh, and, and working with him at a young age. And when, when uh, reconnecting with him in late 2009, going into 2010, uh, he claimed that he'd spent tens of millions of dollars focused on really discovering the, the technology or the principle of action that would enable uh, gravity, you know, anti-gravity and over energy. energy. I, was, I was skeptical, uh, but willing to, to listen. He, he, was, he was a very um, celebrated, respected uh, tech mogul in his 20s, in the, in the 90s. I mean, he sold his first company to Novell uh, as a teenager. And uh, as I'd mentioned, he, he, he'd built the, the world's largest internet consulting firm. Wow. Uh, that I had the privilege of, of advising and working with. So hearing his claims, I was intrigued. I was willing to invest, uh, even willing to, to devote some of our facilities and resources to, to the effort. Well, it ended up becoming a very challenging endeavor. But through that experience, I developed relationships with a team of science advisors that unbeknownst to me were simultaneously advising an elusive billionaire out of Las Vegas named Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace, who as a, as a real estate developer uh, and entrepreneur was, was a kindred spirit of sorts. And so it, at following the closure of that research project, back in 2013, uh, I was surprised to receive a call from the two senior science advisors that had, had been on our board uh, with the question uh, as, you know, asking if I would be interested in having a, a discussion and a meeting with Mr. Bigelow regarding a ranch in northeastern Utah known as Skinwalker Ranch. They asked me if I'd heard of this place. I told them, yeah, I, I was familiar with a book that had been published you know, back in the mid-2000s called Hunt for the Skinwalker. Uh, I chuckled and told them, yeah, I, I didn't know that there was any truth to it, but I remember it being a, uh, an entertaining read at the time. Uh, but I told them, I said, you know that I'm a skeptic. I've never seen a UFO, a ghost orb, you're also aware that I just concluded funding a project where we, by using scientific rigor and discipline, debunked the core claims. And I'm really not interested in, in you know, these, these fringe topics. And I, I happen to believe that there's most likely a natural prosaic explanation for the claims that are being made. Well, they... They proceeded to say, well, Brandon, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. And you as a, as a real estate mogul and advisor in the Intermountain West, you know, uh, seem to be a potential fit to joint venture or at least have a discussion with Mr. Bigelow. And I, I agreed. I I, I jumped at the chance to at least have a meeting, to have a discussion, flew down to Las Vegas and found myself at Mr. Bigelow's uh, Bigelow Aerospace Compound, which is the closest thing to a James Bond villain lair that I've ever seen. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible facility. I mean, huge buildings that house full-size space stations and space habitats that have been designed where they're, they're, they're doing the materials science and the life safety uh, testing and, uh, and engineering to, to really position Bigelow Aerospace, at least at the time, to be the real estate development company of space. 
Wow. And uh, Mr. Bigelow uh, had an interest in in potentially selling the the Utah property. He had expressed uh, he had expressed not only willingness to consider the sale, but the the fact that he was very busy and occupied with uh, you know negotiating deals with SpaceX and NASA and others, uh, you know, playing a key role in the private space race. Uh, we, we had a great visit and I think developed a good relationship. I, I told him that I was a skeptic, that I'd never seen a UFO or a ghost or orb or anything of the sort, and that I would be bringing in my own team. I also asked him for any of the data. Uh, and he said, well, I'm, I'm selling the property on an as-is basis. I'm not willing to turn over any data. Not only because the ranch was part of a Pentagon-funded black budget program between 2007 and 2013, but he he went on to say that he felt you know that he wanted to keep that that private, and I agreed. At the end of the day, I felt that starting with a clean slate would would help me establish a baseline and most likely help me even better establish that there was a natural explanation for so the you, reports. So you wanted a clean slate. You didn't want the, the previous yeah. data or research? No, I didn't push. I, I asked respectfully, and, and I respected his, his response and his request. Did he... So was, it, was, it, <clears throat> was he unable to pass the, the research and the data because it was a black budget program, or... Or did he just he just wasn't willing to share? Yeah, I think I think it was both. Did he want you to continue the research at the ranch? Uh, I think he saw he saw in me a worthy successor as someone who would at least be the appropriate owner, taking it forward. Given my real estate background, proximity to the ranch, you know, I I live about two and a half hours away. It's only about a 45-minute flight via helicopter. Uh, and, and he had heard positive things about me from his science advisors. His science advisors had, um, had told him that I had managed the, the project that we had shared in common uh, with professionalism. And, and I think that... Uh, that meant something to him. He was not putting the property up on the market for sale. I mean, the property was never offered or marketed for sale. This was a very private transaction, private dialogue. And and I told him that I would acquire the property uh, so long as my identity would be kept confidential. And I worked with my legal counsel to structure the entities that would shield my identity. In fact, my name wasn't wasn't on any of the paperwork by design. I had registered agents that uh, that managed that process and truly wanted to stay below the radar and not have my identity associated with the ranch in any way. What, what year was this? 2016. 2016? So I closed, closed on the property the first week in April 2016 and proceeded to bring in my own team and assess really whether there there was any reality to the claims that were being made. At the time, I was on the the board of the National Parks Council, the Boy Scouts of America, and uh, honestly was intending to donate it uh, to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts for a for a potential site that you know where where the, those experiences it could be had because I didn't think that there was anything truly unusual. That I felt like. You know, my investigation and and research would ultimately confirm that there was nothing there was nothing p- paranormal or disturbing about this incredible piece of property. And so, when I flew in and saw the property for the first time, I was shocked at how beautiful, how strikingly beautiful the landscape was. As the helicopter came in, and I was looking over at my brother who was piloting. And looking back at Jim Morse, who I was recruiting to come in and be really the face of the property at the time and be the ranch manager and the community liaison, 
I was taken aback by how beautiful the property was and the diversity of the landscape. Here you have this red rock mesa that runs the entire expanse of the property from east to west. You have waterways that bisect the property. You have these old pioneer homesteads that are still standing uh, that, uh, that, that provide a very unique, interesting backdrop. And, uh, and it is a, a working uh, ranch. I mean, there has been cattle brought on and off the property periodically, and I've, I've maintained that use through my stewardship over the course of the last you know, seven plus years as well. And so when I flew into the property, I was just shocked at how, how beautiful it was. You could shoot any number of Hollywood films, of John Wayne westerns on this property, or even Westworld, which is uh, you know, a, a favorite of mine. Uh, it's, it's that diverse and that strikingly uh, unique. And I proceeded to, to engage professionals to bring in a superintendent within days, Thomas Winterton, who helped assess the physical facilities and what we needed to do in order to install certain things. And we had caretakers at the time. I had a, uh, a, a, a professional, an ex-Marine, who uh, was a drone expert that was tasked with not only conducting drone surveillance of the property, but also developing a historical record of the landscape to better understand every inch of this 512 acre uh, assemblage. How, <clears throat> so when you, when you took over, when you took possession of Skinwalker Ranch, you really had, you didn't have any idea how much activity was actually happening there. No, and I. On top of that, you were, you were a skeptic. You had mentioned last night that you had purchased Skinwalker Ranch to basically debunk the entire yeah. UFO, UAP topic. So what I'm curious about is how, do you, how does somebody that has been conducting experiments with the U.S. government on a black budget program who very much believes in all of these phenomenons that are happening, how do you determine the value when you're selling to a skeptic who wants to acquire it to debunk <laughs> The, ent the entire operation. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a negotiation. It's subjective, but I, I think Mr. Bigelow knew that I was that I was respectful. He knew that I would handle the property with care, with respect. I think that he he respected my desire for anonymity, for privacy. Uh, I, I I didn't tell my family uh, my. You know, my family, my closest business partners were purposely out of the loop and unaware of my acquisition and this new venture uh, by design. So it was it was an interesting launch to to the the saga that continues to unfold with Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, in the first several months, we dealt with primarily challenges dealing with uh, dilapidated infrastructure. We had a, a septic system that wasn't working, that was backed up. I found quickly we didn't have adequate power infrastructure to, to be able to, to secure the property. We, we had no fiber optic connectivity uh, to be able to, to effectively conduct a more advanced investigation. So the, the first several months, I coordinated with you know, Thomas Winterton and Jim Morse and my caretakers and other advisors to, to address the infrastructure issues of this property. It was very, very run down. There was no command center. There was no technology. The reports that Mr. Bigelow uh, received on a weekly basis were, were sent via fax. There was a fax machine in 2016 there was a fax machine that was the primary technology used for disseminating reports relative to activity at the ranch, believe it or not. And uh, uh, I, was, I was surprised to find that, uh, that the ranch was, was in that state. 
I, I was also surprised to find that on the perimeter fence line, there were animal body parts. There were, there were animal bladders hanging from the fence line when I was first shown the property uh, by exiting Bigelow Security. And I asked the security, I said, what, what is the nature of, what the hell is that? What, why, why are those things hanging from the fence line perimeter of the property? And, and the security at the time looked at me with a straight face and said, look, the Native American neighbors that surround this property place these animal bladders on the fence line and bless them to keep the demonic spirits and entities inside this property and off of their property. And I, I quickly learned that the tribal leaders in the Uinta Basin and surrounding the property had been telling their people not to even look the way of the ranch, that they were, they were told, don't even look the way of the property or else you may have demonic forces, entities that would follow you. And, uh, and that's something that, is, that has been discussed and documented, uh, but is, is, a, is an interesting part of the history. So I, I was very surprised when first inspecting the property and visiting the property at what I found. Um, after a couple of months, my surveyor uh, contacted me one day with, uh, with a report that he'd just captured the image of a UFO. It was right about noon in uh, June of 2016. And I said, really? Are you sure? And he said, yeah, I, 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 have, I have it on my, my camera. And I told him, will you stop everything right now don't talk to anyone else. Drive straight to my office because I want the metadata. I want to download that picture without it being corrupted, without it being compromised. I want it directly on my graphic director's computer to be analyzed if, if you really believe that you've captured something. And so he, he did. He drove two and a half hours straight to my office in Salt Lake City and downloaded that image right there in front of me you know, with my graphics director. We still have the metadata, and it was an interesting image. In fact, uh, it reminded me of the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars fame. Really? Um, and uh, and it, was, it was interesting. I checked uh, the, the flight records to see if there was any, any activity, any commercial or private uh, air traffic that would match up with that in the basin during that time uh, that, that, again, corresponded to that metadata, and there was none. And it was, uh, it was intriguing. Was I convinced that, there were, that the, the UFO phenomena was, was real, you know, that there was some extraordinary you know, you know, cause or origin to this? No. But I was intrigued. Several weeks later, I get another call. Brandon, I've got another image. We, myself and the caretakers just saw a glowing object appear right outside of Homestead One or right outside of the ranch house. And I've got the images and I, I, I need to show you this. And I, I told them, drive straight to my office. Uh, please get here as fast as you can. And sure enough, it, it was an intriguing image. We had the metadata. It was very different than the UFO that was captured weeks before. How so? Uh, it, it had a different shape, different characteristics. Do you still have these images? Uh -huh. I'll we'll, share those with you. you we'll bet. put them up on screen. You bet. Uh, and and those, those created some interest. I still was unconvinced. I mean, we have the Utah Test and Training Range out west of Hill Air Force Base. I mean, I've... I've worked uh, as the, the commercial real estate advisor to Falcon Hill and that aerospace research park. And I'm aware that, that there are programs that, that, that are out there and there are tests being conducted that uh, could very well be potentially connected with some of the, the 
unidentified aerial phenomena that uh, that have been reported. So I, I remained curious but unconvinced. And then in October of 2016, I received a call from one of my advisors saying that a certain individual, a prominent doctor out of Las Vegas, who had been working on Area 51, had been a consulting physician to Area 51, had as his number one request, his number one wish on his life bucket list to visit Skinwalker Ranch. Wow. And and this advisor of mine asked if I would be willing to host him. And I said, yeah, of course. I I was intrigued by this individual's background. And I, I said, as long as they sign the confidentiality agreement and the liability waiver that I put in place, I have no problem hosting him. What and, did that conversation go like when he arrived? Well, so they arrive in Salt Lake City, sign the confidentiality agreement. I... I, of course, informed them that I, I did not want my identity as the owner in the public domain. I didn't want that disclosed, and I appreciated them keeping that private. I also told them that there had been reports, of course, for 20-plus years that there's strange activity on the property and that even though I hadn't witnessed anything. I mean, it's a, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself no. here, but as a skeptic, as a skeptic of the entire operation that's been going on there, even yeah. after seeing the, the two the images, photo images yeah. where you, you were still a skeptic, yeah. correct? And now you have a guy who had a major part in Area 51. Right. Which, I mean, what is, what's going through your head when you get a phone call asking you for this guy from Area 51, this is his lifelong dream to come yeah. out to Skimwalker Ranch? I mean, does that validate? No, I, I just thought it was cool. I thought okay. it was interesting. I was happy to host them. And so when they signed the confidentiality agreement and flew into Salt Lake City and met with me, you know, an hour before making the journey and flying out to the ranch, you know, I told them, I said, you understand, I, I've owned the ranch for six months and I haven't yet to experience anything unusual. I've been going out there periodically to inspect the property, meet with my team, and all I find is a beautiful landscape. So if you're expecting that you're going to come out today and see something unusual, bear in mind, I own the property, and I have yet to witness anything personally with my own eyes or even feel anything that would be even slightly unusual out on the property. So I, I look forward to hosting you today. I look forward to, to it being a, a fun day at looking at a, a historic landscape that has a, a very interesting history to it, but uh, don't expect anything more than that. I wanted that disclaimer to be out there yeah. at the very beginning. And so we proceeded to, to fly out to the ranch. We were accompanied by my physicist, uh, who is Eric Bard, who continues to this day as our principal investigator. Eric was also a skeptic. Uh, Eric was the physicist brought in to debunk and disprove the claims of the gravitational physics effort that I had funded at oh, uh, really? our private so hangar this was facility. The so was I thought, who the... better to bring in to bring scientific rigor and discipline and a critical eye and critical thinking skills to the ranch than Eric Bard? He had already disproved these core claims that uh, we had spent millions of dollars investigating. And... Uh, and was a very, very skeptical person. I mean, you could you could flat out call him that he, he, he's a he's a non-believer. And so Eric Bard, the physicist, accompanied us that day, as well as ranch manager Jim Morse. And uh, upon arrival, everyone wanted to hike up the mesa. Everyone wanted to get up on top of the mesa and look out over this incredibly beautiful property. And I was like, okay, fine. Knock yourselves out. I was I was wearing Armani slacks and you know black dress shoes and I didn't want to get dirty and I I was trying to trying to somehow get a line out at the time to to check my my voicemail and so I, they proceeded to hike up to the top of the mesa and within minutes I hear Eric Bard the physicist start shouting down Brandon Brandon get up here. I looked up and I yelled. I said, really? 
you really want me to hike up? You want me to run up the face of the mesa to join you? He says, yes, get up here right now. And he's pointing to his, uh, his iPhone. So I shrug, go booking it up the, uh, the face of the mesa in my dress shoes and my slacks. And, and uh, as I arrive out of breath, at the top of the mesa, he's sitting there looking at his phone and, and motions for me to watch his iPhone. We sit there in silence for minutes. Nothing's happening. I see nothing unusual. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And Eric says, well, you should have seen it. My phone was malfunctioning in the most strange ways. It was, it was turning all sorts of magenta purple color. And I've never seen this. It was very, very unusual. And I just shrugged. I said, well, it, it's not doing it now. And about that time, you know, the others that were up there on the Mesa said that they were feeling a little bit woozy, feeling a little uneasy, they weren't, and wanted to hike back down and proceed with the tour of the ranch. And so we all, we all went down and uh, proceeded to drive out to Homestead 2, which is the, the cluster of old old structures that seems to be a center of gravity for strange phenomena on the property. And as we pull up to Homestead 2 and we're all uh, kind of congregating out in front of those old structures, um, it was uh, it was interesting. You know, a few people said, well, do you feel the, the ground shifting? Uh, and, and even Eric Bard said, yeah, I feel, you guys feeling this sensation that I'm feeling kind of vertigo and I, I was kind of across the courtyard uh, from them, and I, I just smiled and said, no, I, I don't feel anything. And then all of a sudden, Eric says, ah, my phone's doing it again. My phone's malfunctioning again. Well, I, I learned from earlier that I need to move fast if I'm going to see you know, whatever is happening. And so I, I dart over to his side, and sure enough, his whole phone had turned purple, had turned this magenta purplish color and was flashing and acting all erratically. And, uh, and everyone was talking about how they, they were feeling uneasy. Well, thank goodness he had the presence of mind to screen capture the malfunctioning phone. I'll share that with you right now. Thank you. And uh, you can see it. In fact, he was, taking, he was taking photos of me right before standing in the, uh, the entry to Homestead 2 in, in front of the doorway uh, just before you know, they started feeling uneasy and then ultimately the smartphone malfunction started occurring. Uh, it was strange. Uh, my brother, Cameron, who is a you know, very skilled aviator, has multiple degrees in aviation science and management, and my, my little brother, Matthew, who runs operations, who were there, said that they, uh, they weren't comfortable uh, staying. They said, we, we want to... We want to leave. Uh, we'll go to the airport. Call us later on today when you're available, but we're feeling uneasy, which I thought was the silliest thing. I'm like, come on, really? <laughs> <laughs> what? So what? how many people from Area 51? It was, well, so the, the, there was the one, the surgeon, uh, the doctor, and then he was accompanied by two security professionals. One was... Uh, uh, the former president of the California Hells Angels, and another one was a contractor. And then he had his son, uh, who was a grown adult. I don't know how old he was, uh, but he, his son also accompanied. So it was a group of four of them that joined, at the time, my brothers, Eric Bard, who is you know, my consulting physicist, and uh, Jim Morse, ranch manager. And they're all witnessing this. So what what was the conversation like? They sign the paperwork. They sign the the, the non disclosure, the, the 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 waiver. What are they What are they well, hoping to see? Well, I asked them. I said, after telling them, I've never seen a UFO. I've owned the ranch for six months, and all I've seen is a strikingly beautiful landscape. And I'm I'm skeptical. I've never never seen anything like that that I can report. And I I proceeded to ask them. I said, we're sitting there preparing to leave for Skinwalker Ranch. I said, do, do you guys really believe in this UFO crap? And the two security guys, the, the two security professionals that were accompanying the doctor said no. They shook their heads, no, we, we don't believe it. And, uh, and the doctor just smiled. And he says, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. 
you have no idea what is real. And we all we all just kind of shrugged it off. And I, I kind of winked at the two security guards knowingly that, oh, yeah, you know, the, the doctor's you know, probably just another UFO nut, but that's okay. He's a nice <laughs> enough guy. So anyways, we find ourselves out at Homestead 2, smartphone malfunctioning. Everyone's feeling these physical effects. My brothers are feeling uneasy enough that they want to leave, and they leave. They're, they're happier driving and sitting at the airport for hours until I tell them that we're ready to fly back. And uh, and I'm finding the whole thing interesting. Well, as we're, as we're all discussing kind of the history of Skinwalker Ranch and the homesteads, you know, we proceed to kind of get our phones out to take some pictures. I felt like it was a good photo opportunity. And lo and behold, my phone's dead. It had previously been at 80% charge my phone's completely dead. Eric Bard's phone that had recorded that where he had screen captured the uh, the anomaly, the the strange colors and flashing was dead. The others' phones were dead. So we, you know, we didn't have our our cameras. So I thought, darn. Well, we better go take them back to to the ranch house and plug them in and let them charge up, but we don't want to disrupt our day because of it. It was very frustrating. And so we took the phones back, put them in chargers, and then we proceeded to, to return back out to the old homesteads. This time we drove all the way back out to Homestead 3, which is beyond Homestead 2, and it's a single structure. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty haunting looking. And uh, we pull up around the backside of the structure. This is October, October uh, 14th of 2016. And we all pile out and we all walk around the other side. And again, we're looking at the landscape and everyone's visiting and having a good experience. I mean, my brothers have returned, have left and returned to the airport, awaiting a call, you know, hours later. And, uh, and we're just visiting. And after about 10 minutes... I ask, well, where's where's George, the big guy, the the security, uh, the six foot six security um, professional that uh, that was there was wasn't present, and for some reason uh, we kind of lost track of him. And everyone said, well, when we when we all piled out of the uh, the open air Polaris, you know, UTV, the Ranger, you know, no one really paid attention. I said, well, let me go try to find him. So I proceed to walk around to the back of the uh, the homestead, homestead three, to find George. And right as I'm coming around the corner in this, this grass area where we'd parked it and the, the vehicle being off in the distance, it was as if something cupped my ears. It was all of the, all of my hearing was was impacted. It was as if I walked into a into a soundproof room. Have you ever been into an anechoic chamber or a soundproof room? I have. And that sensation, the only the only thing you can do to simulate it right now is by by you know cupping your ears. It's like a frequency change. Yeah, all of the ambient noise disappears. And I thought it was the strangest thing. It was the strangest sensation. And then I see off in the distance standing fully upright, this six foot six giant of a man in the back of this UTV. And I thought, that's odd. So I yell his name, George. And I can hear kind of muffle. It's almost like yelling underwater. I thought that was strange. And I, I proceed to, to walk to get closer and he's not responding. And as I near the vehicle and shout his name again, he's, he's standing upright with his eyes closed. And right as I'm nearing the vehicle, all of the ambient noise, all of the sound comes back, is, is restored. And as I yell his name again, his eyes fluttered open. And he looked down at me. And uh, I said, what's going on? Did something happen? What, what's going on? And he said, well, that was weird. And I, I asked him, I said, what was weird? What, what is weird? And he, he says, well, when you all jumped out when you pulled up 
and you all, you stopped the vehicle and you all jumped out, I stood up and found myself paralyzed. I couldn't speak, I couldn't move, and then everything went black. And he asked, "How long have I been how long have I been here?" And I said, "About 10 minutes." And he just shook his head, was was obviously disturbed. I asked him, I said, has this ever happened to you in your life? Have you ever had this experience? And he said, no, I've never experienced anything like this. Ten minutes wow. had passed. Who knows what happened, but he, he felt odd. He expressed the fact that he felt a little bit off, and... Uh, and we proceeded to gather everyone up and uh, and jump back in the vehicles. And so as we're we're going back to retrieve our phones to have our cameras, we're driving on that dirt road at the base of the mesa. You know that main road that you see on the docu series that runs east west on the property. And as we're about halfway back to Homestead One or the ranch house or the command center as we now call it. The other security professional in the back starts shouting, stop the vehicle, stop the vehicle. And I'm driving, I'm just trucking along, driving this little Polaris UTV. And I look back and he's waving his hands, pointing up ahead. So I, I, I bring the vehicle to a stop. And he's just shouting, he says, look at that, look at that. And sure enough, I look right where he's pointing, right ahead of us, right above the mesa, at four o'clock in the afternoon on October 14th, and there is a 40, 50 foot long silver grayish disc like object. What can only be described as a flying saucer. And it's just sitting there in, in broad daylight, clear as day, right above the mesa, probably about 100, 100 feet above the mesa or so. And we're all sitting there astonished. I'm like, you guys see that? And he's like, yeah, that's what I, I was trying to get you to stop, stop the vehicle. Within a couple of seconds, it changes position. It literally blinked from one position to another. Either it moved with split second speed or it was able to, to change position through some other means, but it moves about 50 feet to the left or to the north. We all, like it appeared 50 feet to well, the left, or you actually darted, saw it, it move? It was like in the blink of an eye, it could change position and move that quickly. We all sat there astonished. And said, Whoa, did you see that? Seconds later, it drops to just kind of a low hover above the mesa. It, it literally changes position and drops right above the mesa. Still sitting there, clear as day. It was almost like a video game. It looked, It was surreal. And then within a few seconds later, it darts to the right. We're all, with every movement, we're gasping. We're saying, are you watching this? Do you see this? And then within about 20 seconds from the start of the event, it is gone. It, either, it, it appeared that it either went to a dot as if it were darting off into the distance at split second speed, or it was literally phasing out of our perception instantaneously. Uh, but it was gone. And that whole event spanning about 20 seconds that I saw right in front of us with multiple witnesses at my side that I had not met before that day that had professed the same skepticism that morning sat there changed forever. In that moment, Sean, I went from being an open-minded skeptic to an experiencer. It wasn't, it wasn't about belief. It was undeniable. It was fact. What we saw was real. Eric Bard, my physicist and principal investigator, upon all of us getting back, asked that we not talk with each other about the event. He wanted to get our independent testimony, which was wise. He wanted to make sure that we all saw the same thing and all reported the same thing. Uh, and he, 
he did. He he independently took down all of our testimony that matched up, that aligned perfectly. We all saw the same UFO, the same erratic behavior, and we were unchanged. What, or, what amount or, of, we, we were changed by that day. It was crazy. What amount of time were you from top of the mesa where the phone started, where Eric's phone started acting up to? Two hours. So two that, hours. That's a hell of a sequence two, three of hours. events. Yeah. For, t- for yeah. two hours of well, time. And we get back, and here, here's the postscript. Not only did we all give matching independent testimony relative to the events of the day in that specific event, the next morning, the six foot six security professional that had the experience out at Homestead 3 checked himself into the hospital where he sat for weeks with an illness that no one could diagnose, that he described as the, the worst sickness he'd ever experienced in his life. He couldn't get up, couldn't walk. And this immediately followed the experience. I mean, that's a lot of correlating events Mm -hmm. that took place on that day. You have smartphone malfunction, rapid battery depletion, acute medical episodes. For multiple people. Yeah, multiple witnesses. A diversity of witnesses, including two who who chose to leave the area, were, were so uncomfortable they did not want to stick around. And then a UFO sighting in broad daylight with multiple witnesses. All of those things that occurred in October 2016 changed my entire perspective. And from that point forward, I proceeded to not only allocate significant funds in order to establish the scientific platforms and the security necessary in order to to study this property and to to document the reality of the phenomena. But uh, I was focused on bringing in the right team and expanding the team of professionals in order to to understand the nature of what we are dealing with. Uh, Within months, we we installed uh, full security gated entrance with the guard shack that you see today. We had all of the power infrastructure upgraded, trenched, installed, fiber optic infrastructure put in place. We transformed with the help of Thomas Winterton and contractors, the, uh, the old dilapidated double wide security trailer into a command center that still serves as a, uh, as a key point of research uh, there on the ranch, and we proceeded to to graduate from game cameras and 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 very um, very basic surveillance cameras and tools to to I think much more sophisticated platforms to monitor what is happening at the ranch, and the rest is history. Um, over the next year, we proceeded to take more data to document additional uh, events of UFO activity and other high strangeness. And uh, it, it propelled us forward. News of a new terror attack, this time in West Africa. Special forces in the capital of Mali have stormed a luxury hotel where gunmen are holding up to 170 hostages. The standoff at the Radisson Blue. How many bodies were you seeing? The first few um, were just kind of like sporadic in the foyer area. And then, did you know any of them? This one American just like called and said that he's trapped in a room on fire. 
and he's hiding under one of the banquet tables and they're shooting over top of him. Please come get me, come help me. I can't do this alone. The gunmen are like coming down the stairs and they're on the landing and then we lock eyes. And then he yells out Akbar at me and fucking there's moments of blacking out. All right, Brandon, we're back from the break and we just kind of finished up your first experience of uh, seeing phenomena and UFOs at the ranch. And so there's a couple questions, just rewinding. Um, you had to, so I know you had mentioned that Bigelow did not really reveal much of what was going on at that ranch, but I would oh, think other than that. Yeah. After that day, you had to be dying to get back in touch with him and 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 ask questions. After what you just experienced, did you do that? I I reached out to his people, to Doctor Kelleher and others that had been advising Mister Bigelow, and and asked if there's any way we could share data from the past or collaborate I'd, simply to to better understand the nature of the phenomena at the ranch and and mr bigelow was not not interested and that's okay i i i respected it he wanted to hold all of that keep it close to the vest and uh, and We I don't mean to have this pregnant pause. So I'm gonna answer your question well. So which is and the truth. The truth is within weeks following that event, I wanted to pull together an advisory board and Mr. Bigelow to discuss our investigation and what we had been experiencing at the ranch, what had been documented. And so we pulled everyone together months later uh, at, uh, uh, at the ranch and also hosted a gathering in Salt Lake City uh, in the spirit of collaboration. And even though a lot of it was focused on just discussing what had been reported and experienced in the past on the property, we were discussing the future scientific protocols and the investigation. And I was very clear with everyone that I, I wanted to use scientific rigor and discipline to carefully document the phenomena and, and ultimately understand the nature of what was happening. There has been great disagreement relative to the origin and the the agenda associated with the phenomena not just at skinwalker ranch but globally there's a lot of uh divide a lot of different op uh, different opinions so there's some people who say that it's all benevolent that we're being visited by beings from other world that are benevolent beings and star people and there are others that say that there's a more insidious a darker uh, motive and agenda, they point to the cattle mutilation phenomena. I mean, you're talking over 10,000 reported and documented cases. So you can bet on the fact that there are probably over 100,000 that have been unreported that have occurred. I mean, it's been called the greatest unsolved crime spree in the country. Uh, and there's still no explanation. No one has been caught Still to this day. To this day, no one has been caught 
in the act of you know, conducting a cattle mutilation. It's very mysterious. And of course, that's part of the history. There have been a lot of bizarre cattle mutilations that have occurred on this property that are well documented. Uh, Mr. Bigelow, to his credit, uh, brought in a veterinarian, uh, brought in experts to consult and provide reports uh, within the uh, the first several months of opening the ranch up for a docu series effort. Of course, we had a a young calf, a two year old calf, perfectly healthy, die just south of Homestead One, right there near the fence line, and investigated that incident. Of course. We had multiple smartphones that were malfunctioning, both an iPhone and a Samsung Galaxy device that were both malfunctioning simultaneous with the investigation and discovery of the cow. We had, you know, elevated uh, gamma and other readings that were that were documented. And then, of course, an object that was captured by the camera surveillance going over right above that cow right about the time that it died. Uh, that it fell over. And uh, I think one of the most intriguing parts of that part of the investigation is the fact that even when bringing out the Utah State veterinarian, again, this is the veterinarian for the state of Utah with the Department of Agriculture, who comes out over a year after the cow died to inspect the site to inspect the carcass, finding no predator activity. It had remained completely untouched, mysteriously, on a piece of property where nothing, nothing survives. Any, any dead animal is quickly dispatched by any Wait, number of coyotes. Are you saying the cow had not decomposed and it wasn't drugged off by predators or anything? No predator or scavenger activity had touched it. In a year? Over a year. Wow. The Utah State Veterinarian proceeded to order tests, actually took samples. Those tests revealed that there was no poisoning. There was nothing unusual that they could point to that would account for the absolute lack of predator or scavenger activity. And to this day, it remains one of the the most mysterious Incidents captured on camera and well documented, involving third party experts that uh, that remain baffled. Uh, so it, we're dealing with a very dynamic set of bizarre circumstances that continue to be documented in one location on the planet, which happens to be there at Skinwalker Ranch. And it, uh, it really is the greatest science project of our time. Let's, let's go back into just a little bit more of the history of it. So the backstory. So this goes, this goes way previous to Robert Bigelow in 1996. The Shermans owned it from 1994 to 1996, only two years, and sold it for $200,000 right. to Bigelow. What? Did they sell it because of all the, the activity that was happening? Yeah. Well, if you go back in time, the property was originally homesteaded. I mean, you had Native Americans that were part of the, the process, and you had old early homesteaders that built the structures on the property and resided on the property going back to the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, by the 1940s, the Myers family, and specifically Kenneth and Edith Myers, uh, proceeded to live there and ranch on the property and stayed there their entire lives. Uh, both Kenneth and Edith ended up passing away uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, Kenneth passed away in the late 80s, and Edith uh, ended up putting being put in uh, assisted care, I believe, in the early 90s. And, and their brother-in-law, who had legal authority over the estate, sold the property in 1994 to the Sherman family, who desired 
a place to to you know raise cattle and their family. Shortly after the Shermans acquired the property, they were overwhelmed with not only cattle mutilation events that were occurring with their prized cows, but also poltergeist-like activity and even UFO sightings that were occurring on a, on a pretty regular basis. They were being terrorized. Word filtered out through the community that the Shermans were experiencing this and they were talking to their neighbors and, uh, and calling people in. It caught the attention of a journalist at the Deseret News, a guy named Zach Van Eyck, who came out, was convinced that they were credible, that they were telling the truth, and you know, wrote, a, 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 I think, several articles uh, detailing the accounts of UFO activity, bizarre cattle mutilations, and other strangeness on the property. Those accounts made their way to one Robert Bigelow in North Las Vegas. Mr. Bigelow had established the National Institute for Discovery Science, a separate side project and program for investigating strange phenomena, including UFOs and cattle mutilation. And he quickly flew in on his private jet, accompanied by Colonel John Alexander, and cut a deal with the Shermans acquired the property quickly, kept Mr. Sherman on for a short period of time to help with the transition, and his team of scientists not only locked down the whole property and secured it, but they proceeded to put up observation towers with bait pens surrounded by razor wire. There are three observation towers located across the property that, uh, that incorporate bait pens where they would use animals as biosensors to to hopefully draw out whatever entities were, were there on the property, uh, predator-like activity as, as they described it. Um, and they proceeded to, to launch a, a rigorous investigation at the time in 1996 that continued on for years. And of course, years later, you know, the events, the activity, the investigation at Skinwalker Ranch was brought to the attention of officials at the Pentagon. They had several visitors who had experiences, very compelling, uh, undeniable experiences of paranormal activity. And uh, that led to the, the black budget Pentagon funded program that involved the ranch at its center. And the rest is history, you know. But by by 2013, that program had ceased for various reasons. Mr. Bigelow was actively engaged with growing his aerospace company and 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 jumping into the private space race, as we discussed. And the ranch, to a degree, it it had faded. At the time, I was led to believe that it was simply because Mr. Bigelow was just buried, was very busy with with getting his his beam modules and his space habitats up in orbit and ultimately on the moon and Mars, which I believe was true. But also, I've learned he ascribed negative events afflicting his family to really his ownership of the ranch. Really? Uh, Mr. Bigelow uh, blamed the ranch for dark disturbing events that happened in their lives. And it's not my story to tell. It's been told by others in the media and advisors, but uh, uh, owning the ranch was not a positive experience for him. You, even before him though, this went back to Native American tribes. I mean, even in, in the show, yeah. you know, I, I believe he, correct me if I'm wrong, are they hydroglyphs? Is that what you call them? Petroglyphs. So petroglyphs. there's rock art. There's, you know, we have a, a, a megalithic site there uh, uh, as well that we've investigated in the area. Uh, but there's a lot of rock art and, and evidence of, of the ancients, of the, the Native Americans uh, working on the property. There's also a strange Masonic symbol that is etched into the, the face of the Mesa that 
many of many of uh, claimed symbolizes as above, so below. Uh, there are a lot of things relative to the history that are intriguing uh, and a little bit ambiguous, but the the Native American history, the tradition, and the fact that the Navajo tribe cursed this property as a result of conflict with the Ute tribe and the federal government is something that has been confirmed over and over by, by members of the community, by elders, and the ridge that runs the expanse of the property, that Mesa Plateau or that ridge has been referred to as Skinwalker Ridge for a very long time. In fact, when the Bigelow team first descended on the property and set up their investigation and heard the accounts of you know, the curse, the Skinwalker curse and the lore that surrounded this property, it ultimately was referred to as Skinwalker Ranch as opposed to the Utah Ranch. You know, for a period of time, it was just simply the Utah Ranch or the Bigelow Ranch in Utah and then took on the identity of Skinwalker Ranch as, as they just simply started referring to the property as such as a result of the, the Native American. What history. is a Skinwalker? A Skinwalker is a shape-shifting demonic entity it's essentially a, a Native American witch or warlock that that sells their soul in exchange for immortality, the ability to take on the skin or shape shift, oftentimes in the form of a wolf, a dire wolf, or a werewolf-like creature, but they can also take on the shape of other animals as well. Uh, and it's it's a topic that... I found the Native American community likes to stay away from. They don't like to discuss it, to even say the name Skinwalker is, uh, is negative. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a key part of their cultural tradition and history. Skinwalkers to the Native Americans in the Uinta Basin are just as real as this, this chair, as this bottle of... Diet Mountain Dew, it's a, it's, it's a very real part of their cultural uh, history. Okay. The last part of the history that I want to talk about is we, we spoke a little bit last night about remote viewing and some studies that, that Stanford was doing. And how does that tie in with yeah. Skinwalker Ranch? I believe that consciousness plays a role. And consciousness studies will play a role in understanding the nature of what we are dealing with at Skinwalker Ranch. I think the the uh, the remote viewing, you know, practice or phenomena, I believe, has validity to it. Uh, we've had a number of gifted intuitives that have consulted uh, with our research. Uh, we have uh, avoided some of that uh, with respect to the document the documentary series. Uh, as we're still gathering data, and some of it is inconclusive, a lot of it is very controversial. But I think that the nature of our consciousness and, and really the world around us has yet to truly be understood. Do you want to talk about any of those studies that haven't been released yet? No, I think we'll be addressing those in the future. Okay. Uh, but I, I would say that a, a key part of what characterizes our investigation and our research versus, you know, decades past is the fact that we've we've taken a very um, multidisciplinary approach, a very transparent approach with the community, uh, not only in engaging the Native American community and our neighbors in a positive way in order to gather data and understand what is happening, you know, because we're living in a very dynamic environment. We're, we're under no illusion that the phenomena is confined to the fence line at Skinwalker Ranch. It, it, it permeates and, and goes out through the, the entire Uinta Basin. Uh, one of the leading experts that documented since 1950 UFO activity in great detail was a 
a, a very respected teacher and electrician named Joseph Junior Hicks. People refer to him as Junior Hicks. He passed away a few years ago in the middle of really the, the docu-series being unveiled to the public. He, he had spent 70 years documenting UFO activity in the Uinta Basin and all of the properties surrounding Skinwalker Ranch. And his files, coupled with the NIDS, the Bigelow team files, uh, stand as a very compelling documentary record of activity in the Uinta Basin uh, and and the ranch in general. But uh, as, as much as this property seems to be the center of gravity and is exhibiting the highest frequency of UFO activity and high strangeness, it it covers the, the Uinta Basin. I mean, people out there have uh, continued to have experiences. Even the, the oil and gas uh, industry has had uh, incidents occur relative to you know, their sites out there. And there are a lot of professionals who have remained silent, have not wanted to go public, that are now finally reaching out to our team and letting their stories be told. These are firsthand accounts of activity that correlates with what we are seeing at Skinwalker Ranch. Wow, this is, and this just continues to happen just more and more. Yeah, I, I think momentum is building. I mean, you know, over the course of even this week, um, we revealed video taken of potentially what, what could be the first clear evidence of transmedium, UAP or transmedium, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena that was caught, captured, coming down from the sky, dropping into the east field portion of the ranch, and then exiting right below the helicopter, caught on GoPro camera, exiting the Mesa. Uh, there, are, there are countless events that have been documented, all involving uh, an army of third-party professionals, experts working in service to documenting and understanding the nature of what we are dealing with. I mean, <clears throat> see, you got it in 2016. This started all this. It started happening, what, six, I think, believe he said six months after, after the transaction. Yeah. I personally had my encounter, had my UFO experience with multiple witnesses six months after acquiring the property. And we've progressed significantly since that time in terms of not only the the scientific platforms but also the 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 amount of experts engaged i mean we've recently brought uh, on as strategic partners omnitech led by ceo jim royston who is the former executive director of the international space station national lab uh, his partner and co-founder is retired four-star general lance lord former head of U.S. Space Command. Uh, their team includes some of the most credentialed experts when it comes to sensor technology and data collection in a host of environments globally. I mean, these are platforms that have been deployed on the battlefield in, in a diversity of climates and environments that are now being brought to bear at Skinwalker Ranch and being deployed in service to understanding the nature of what we're what we're doing, I don't know that that has really sunk in with everyone. I mean, it's not just the fact that we brought the largest drone operating company in the country with Sky Elements to the table with over 200 drones for the drone experiment that resulted in what? Rapid battery depletion, GPS anomalies, all sorts of strange never before experienced malfunctions, and then a UFO. I think a lot of people forget that a UFO ended up dropping out of the sky and appearing above 40 professionals. Yeah. Simultaneous with all of the drones malfunctioning. And then that UFO went back up into the sky and disappeared, didn't exit, you know, was no longer seen, but it was clear as day to everyone present. You tell me, 
How hard would it be to get over 40 people to go on record with witnessing a UFO simultaneous with documenting rapid battery depletion, GPS anomalies, and a host of other strangeness? It's, it's, in my view, it's undeniable. I have a hard time understanding how people are skeptical when there is so much data. They're just, they're not looking into it. They're not looking into it. Well, that's, or, that's the only way. Well, after, it's, after some of the things that you guys have documented and, and just plain as day, it's, they're, it's just, yeah. But, Going back a little bit, so you, after after your experience, you immediately started putting together more of the team. You had right. Eric Bard. Sounded like you had uh, Dragon. Eric Bard, yeah, principal investigator Jim Morse, who, by the way, was my first big developer client when I was eighteen years old. Oh, Jim, really? Jim was developing the towers at Southtown, multiple Class A office towers, a hotel, restaurants. Uh, right in the middle of the Salt Lake suburban market. And at 18, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work on his projects. And when I got home from my mission at age 21, picked right back up where we left off, and Jim hired me to essentially continue the the final phases of that project. Um, one thing about Jim that I learned in being his broker and his advisor was his love for the Native American community and his commitment to raise millions of dollars for scholarships and aid for the tribes is, is something that I grew to really respect over the years. Decades before acquiring Skinwalker Ranch or, or having any idea that we would come together under these circumstances. When I flew out to see the ranch for the first time, having Jim as an advisor and appointing him as ranch manager seemed like a natural fit due to his strong relationships and respect for the tribes, for the Native American people. So you have Jim Morse, Thomas Winterton, who we engaged, who is a respected contractor, entrepreneur out in the basin. Uh, you know, hotel owner at the time, uh, Eric Bard, principal investigator, plasma physicist with patents to his name, uh, and incredible credentials. Uh, Dragon, you know, Brian Arnold, my head of security, Caleb Bench, who is a retired Marine, uh, also uh, part time with the uh, with law enforcement with the the, the county sheriffs department out there that is, has been given the latitude to work with us uh, when he's not engaged with, uh, with his law enforcement activities. Um, we have a, a credentialed anthropologist, in fact, a published anthropologist in Candace Lindy, who uh, is our ranch caretaker along with Tom Lewis, uh, technologists that uh, reside there full time, and then a host of other experts and professionals that have collaborated with us. Yeah, everyone from you know LIDAR, photogrammetry technicians, instrumented balloon and rocket professionals, uh, to ground penetrating radar and even environmental consultants in testing the property to help us understand whether we're dealing with something that still could be naturally impacted or affected. How did Dr. Travis Taylor come on scene? Yeah, you know, when it was funny, Travis Taylor was recommended by the History Channel okay. as, a, as a credentialed physicist that could come in and ask the hard questions and drive the team. Let me take you back in time. Following my own UFO experience in October 2016, and the months following, we ramped up the investigation aggressively with our team. 
we started consulting with other advisors, even staying in touch with the former scientists that had worked on the, the program in order to inform them what we were seeing and ask for any insight that they could render. By 2018, the command center had been taking documentation, had been you know, utilized with all of the camera surveillance, the, the, the sensors that we had in place, the, the FLIR camera system that we have deployed uh, to, to monitor changes in the environment that are potentially unusual. And then one day I received a call from Washington, D.C. Uh, this is when my identity was still confidential, secret as owner. So I was surprised to receive the call. And the, the call was to to come to Washington to provide a briefing, an update relative to my ownership and stewardship in follow-up to the activities of the previous owner. We flew out to D.C. and um, were, were happy to provide a briefing and update them on the reality of what was happening at the ranch. Again, UFO activity, acute medical episodes, especially multiple acute medical episodes that had occurred along with those reports. The, the electromagnetic anomalies that had been carefully documented and some of the other strangeness that defied any conventional explanation. About that time, I was also receiving calls through Jim Morse and Thomas Winterton from producers of the History Channel wanting to meet with the owner to discuss a docu-series, the ability to come in and document the events occurring on this, this piece of property. Word was starting to get out that, uh, that there was an ongoing investigation. There were photos that uh, were leaked online that showed that there was a security presence there and that there was a very sophisticated effort. And uh, producers of the History Channel were hell-bent on getting an audience with whoever this mysterious owner was in order to pitch the opportunity to, to have a docu-series effort that would record and document what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. They reached out for over a year. So for over a year on a weekly basis, I was being hounded by my people <laughs> to at least consider potentially responding to the phone calls. And after a year, I reluctantly agreed to the meeting subject to a confidentiality agreement being signed by everyone. Producers flew in. We had a discussion. I said, number one, condition. If I were to, if I were to consider this, number one, it has to be true. Nothing can be faked, manipulated, or contrived. I have no interest in being part of some ghost hunters type effort with a bunch of guys tripping over themselves in the dark with night vision. This has to be true. And I have to have final cut on everything if we were to do anything. Number two, you have to use my team. We're not having any Hollywood casting call. We're not bringing in individuals from the outside that could potentially compromise the integrity of the scientific investigation that I've been privately funding to the tune of millions of dollars up until that point. And number three was that my identity needed to remain confidential. I had no interest in being on television. I didn't want my name associated with it. Again, even my family at the time had no idea that I owned the ranch, along with business partners and others. Why, why were you so hell-bent on being on everything being confidential? I did not want my ownership of this property or the topics associated with Skinwalker Ranch to in any way divert from or compromise or undermine my professional endeavors, my commercial real estate practice and other entrepreneurial activity. As chairman of the largest commercial real estate enterprise in the Intermountain West, representing Fortune 500 companies and, and working closely with the governor's office and other agencies, I, 
I did not want this project with Skinwalker Ranch to in any way uh, detract from the decades of work to to serve clients and to, to transform the skylines of our communities. I, I felt a great responsibility to my clients and I didn't I didn't know if it would be um, taken well by my clients. Uh, I didn't know how people would react and I had no interest. I didn't want any attention and uh, wanted to fiercely protect the, uh, the professional side of my life and didn't want these two worlds to collide. Well, it was funny, the, uh, the gentleman I met with at the time, Kevin Burns, who was the president of Prometheus Entertainment, who was kind of the, the number one production company for History Channel at the time. I mean, of course, he's the creator of Ancient Aliens, The Curse of Oak Island, Beyond Oak Island, The Unexplained with William Shatner. You know, had launched a series on Netflix, Lost in Space, big budget sci-fi epic. Um, he's a genius. He's a very talented producer looked at me and he said, look, you talk about integrity. You want the truth to get out there. You're an experiencer, yet you aren't willing to put your name behind this. How are people going to believe the truth? How are they going to believe the authenticity and genuine nature of what you're doing if you yourself aren't willing to go public? as part of this effort. And he had a point. Uh, it, he essentially Jedi mind tricked me into agreeing to go public. I told him, I said, you know this is going to turn my world upside down. That's, you a, understand? that's a hell of a gamble on your part. Yeah. It, and it's a greater liability. No one understands what a liability this is. I have yet to take a penny personally relative to these efforts. I've never opened a bank account for adamantium real estate, for the entity that controls the ranch. I have purposely donated, assigned any proceeds that would be due to me to, to other causes, you know, from scholarships you know, to cancer research. I have no interest in taking a penny relative to this endeavor. And so I all really profit have... coming to you from this show no. goes to charity. Yeah. That's amazing. Charity and other efforts. I mean, we have used some uh, funds in order to help bolster the infrastructure that have gone to, to vendors, but no, no money, not one penny has made its way into my pocket personally by design. That's incredible. And I, 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 I want the truth more than anyone. And I'm willing to put my money and obviously my reputation where my mouth is. Uh, this really is a greater liability to me than an asset. And uh, I'm hell-bent on getting the truth. As I stated earlier, I'm not, I'm not a believer. I'm an experiencer. I can't unsee that which I have witnessed with multiple witnesses at my side and have continued to document over the last seven years. What we are seeing at Skinwalker Ranch is real. And it has the ability to completely change the way we look at the world, our place in the universe, and, and how, how we view reality. <clears throat> Back to DC. They called you in for some type of a briefing, how, how receptive were they? Very. They're very receptive, very respectful. Uh, we preceded the briefing with, with me you know, preparing with the team, with Eric Bard, and uh, at the time, Dr. Jim Segala, who uh, was, was participating in, in the, the, uh, the first year of our docuseries, and, and, uh, and another senior advisor, uh, yeah, we proceeded to present a, a, a full keynote PowerPoint presentation. And it was very it was very evident that those individuals who who held high levels of position of seniority 
uh, were respectful and took this seriously and had knowledge that these things are real. Who, who, who exactly were you briefing? Was it the Senate Intelligence Committee or? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it, it was, uh, it was, it was a good opportunity for me to demonstrate how serious I took my stewardship of the property. And the fact that we are using scientific discipline and rigor in order to address these topics and the phenomena at the ranch. I, I tell people all the time, I use the word steward. I really believe that this is a stewardship, not just an ownership. And having a collaborative partnership with people who can bring skills and resources to the table to better understand what is happening is, is a key, you know, a hallmark of our investigation. Has the, has the Intelligence Committee at the Senate offered any funding or any assistance? No, I haven't or, asked for any. I don't have any interest. Do I, they, have, I have no interest in asking for money, engaging the government. I've never held a security clearance. Okay. I don't have any interest in, uh, in that type of formal engagement. I am interested in being transparent and collaborative with, with anyone, including the, the general public. I mean, the docu-series is my effort to disclose to the public the reality of our investigation as it unfolds. And, and that is perhaps one of the most exciting parts of this effort, this endeavor that I, I would have never anticipated, is the opportunity to allow the public a view behind the scenes as, as the investigation progresses. Uh, show me another effort on the planet where there's a 24-hour live stream for the public to access, where there is more collaboration and more open disclosure and presentation of events, of data and activity. I don't, I don't believe there has ever been an effort like this. I don't either. When, when the, so History Channel got a hold of you, you guys made the negotiation and, and, and the docuseries started. Travis Taylor got introduced. Yeah, so. Uh, you had placed yeah. every member on that team, correct? Right. You had you had until vetted that and, time and until until, then. until the docu series effort, and the History Channel they didn't require it; they suggested it. They said we, we'd like to suggest bringing in one person, a, a physicist, a credentialed physicist, who is a skeptic who will challenge the team. And I wasn't excited. The team had no interest in bringing in another member of the family. I mean, they didn't want to bring someone in to, to, to potentially ruin the dynamic that, that we had created. But we flew everyone out to Los Angeles to meet with Dr. Taylor and, uh, and production. And I was pleasantly surprised at how qualified Dr. Taylor, I mean, he has two PhDs in physics. He has multiple master's degrees. He's a published author. He's worked with NASA, with Army Intelligence. He's worked on classified programs. Uh, I was impressed with his credentials. Anyone who looks at his, at his profile, at his credentials, and scoffs, they're, they're, they're being disingenuous. It, it came out later on the docuseries that he was on the UAP UFO task force for the Pentagon. Right. Well, which flew under the radar for you and the rest of your yeah, team. It was shocking. And, and it, it frankly pissed off several members of my team. They felt betrayed to a degree for a while. I, the fact that Dr. Taylor had taken a position as the chief scientist for the UAP task force at the Pentagon and had not disclosed to the team what was going on and that he was working in that capacity was a, it was a significant concern. We had to talk through that. And Dr. Taylor, who was called on the carpet, I mean, to, to essentially account for you know, the situation, said that, look, after, after it became known that he was consulting with Skinwalker Ranch 
and he was part of our effort. You know, a, a senior official with the Pentagon reached out to him and asked him to engage, but made him do so under certain confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements. I mean, he was under oath to, to not disclose the nature or his involvement with the UAP task force. And I have to respect the fact that he kept that confidence. How did that make you feel? Even, let's just take Travis out of the equation. You had already gone to DC, you had briefed the Senate Intelligence Committee, and now they have an asset unannounced to you working at your property yeah. that you're funding the experiments on. And how long, that went on for what, two, three years? Three years, yeah. Three years, you didn't know. And then it gets disclosed. Yeah. How did that, in all, in, 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 by the way. It was mind blowing. There's yeah. also all this surveillance going on with, with what, 1.6 gigahertz, I believe. And you have the planes flying, um, sure. obvious, very obvious surveillance patterns over the ranch. You have Blackhawks, you have Chinooks flying around yeah, all the co time. Covert military surveillance seems to be a constant. And there. so how did that make you feel knowing that you had an asset of the U.S. government involved in, in your investigation? Uh, mixed. I had mixed feelings at the time. Um, I, I respected the fact that Travis did keep it confidential. The fact that he didn't pull anyone aside and whisper to them what he was doing speaks to his integrity. And I think that's important. That's mm -hmm. important. No matter how it looks, the reality is he kept his oaths. He did not violate his NDAs, even when he was probably under a lot of pressure, feeling like he probably should. And I'm sure he desperately wanted to disclose it. Um, so I, I have to respect his integrity. I also have to point out that Travis Taylor is not the principal investigator. The chief scientist at Skinwalker Ranch, going on seven years, is Eric Bard. Eric Bard is the one who lives at Skinwalker Ranch, who lives in the command center full time, has structured the platforms, is conducting the scientific investigation and leading it. Dr. Taylor, while an important member of the team and someone that I respect, I actually love Dr. Taylor. I think he's, he's been an incredible uh, influence and asset to us. He's, he's a consulting physicist and he's there to aid the team, but he's not manipulating the investigation. I can say with absolute certainty, he has not manipulated the data, the science, or anything else relative to the ranch. I mean, he's, he's been a very supportive participant and uh, physicist that has been a, uh, a great complimentary fit with Eric and the team. Wasn't always that way. We had a, a few months at the very beginning that were a little rocky as everyone was kind of trying to find their footing. You know, Dragon, for example, had took issue with uh, with feeling marginalized and and felt talked down to at times by Dr. Taylor and and other scientists. And you know, there there's always a period of time when people are trying to build relationships of trust with each other and you know starting this effort was no different but yeah i i i have not been as concerned with what transpired simply because i i respect the fact that dr taylor didn't breach any of his his oaths or ndas and he hasn't been the one uh directing the science investigation he's been a great compliment and supporter no oh, good <clears throat> There's right off the bat, and at the at the very beginning of the docu series, there was there was a the number one rule seemed to have been no digging, right? No going below the ground. What prompted that? Uh, that had been told. To, I mean, we were we were told that digging on the property resulted in negative 
negative outcomes, that people would be harmed, that any time the earth was disturbed, bad things happened. And taking into account the health and safety of those involved and the fact that this is a this is a televised effort. This is an effort being documented by dozens of professionals, arguably the leading documentary professionals in the country. I felt it was wise to be cautious. I gave Dragon specific direction to limit any digging activity, anything that would disturb the earth that may stimulate negative response that would result in injury or harm. And it was a, it really was a fear. It still is. We still have incidents that have occurred in tandem with experimental activity, with disturbing the earth. I mean, we had, you know, Tom Lewis, who, you know, last year, ended up in the hospital in the emergency room with a cardiac e episode that, that occurred immediately simultaneous with digging activity into the base of the mesa. Was that a coincidence? I don't think so. I, there was you know, the 1.6 gigahertz that the frequency showed up. There was, there was equipment malfunction that was captured on camera. And then, unfortunately, Tom Lewis is is recorded going down on his knees with, with a cardiac arrest, has to be run to the hospital by Dragon, and he's still being monitored. And thankfully, he's almost back to 100%, but it was really concerning. We've had a number of incidents where people have ended up in the hospital with mysterious illnesses and injuries. And a lot of those occasions seem to be attended by digging activity with, with aggressive activity on the ranch. Um, have I loosened that up since the first season from those first months? Yes. I mean, I, when my team tells me, let us dig, when I have Thomas Winterton, who spent a week in the hospital fighting for his life as a result of injuries that he believes and the doctors believe are connected, to his activity on the ranch when Thomas Winterton is hell-bent on digging deeper, both figuratively and literally, to find out what is happening, the mechanism behind this strange activity at the ranch, I, I have to defer to them. I, I have to give them the latitude to get to the bottom of the truth and take more aggressive measures to, to hopefully get some answers. And so... We've relaxed it. We've added more safety precautions since. But uh, the no digging rule and uh, the mandate that I gave years ago has, uh, has been relaxed, but it's been as a result of both pressure and also respect, respectful requests from the team to be able to do their work. <clears throat> There's there's so many aspects of this ranch that I want to cover. It's, it's hard to away. it's hard to organize it all into one thing. So I'm just going to stick with the digging. But you know, you you guys are finding a some type of a metal substance within the mesa, right? You've seen UAPs fly into above the mesa, hover above the mesa, fly into the mesa, fly out of the mesa. Are you going to excavate that site? We're working on that. Uh, the mesa is a very unstable environment. The rocks are very unstable. Those boulders at the base that you see mm -hmm. came from the top. Oh, good. Um, every time that we dig, that we conduct any type of excavation or exploratory activity, and disturb the earth, it's, it, it's very dangerous. We see material come down. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous environment. We also don't want to damage the very technology or artifact or whatever may be buried in the mesa that is unnatural that may be connected to 
the strange activity. Um, the, the, the metallic substance that was recovered through the biopsy, through the, the drilling exercises that was analyzed by the University of Utah and shown to be you know, not naturally occurring, and according to Dr. Taylor and others, to be matching the composition of, of you know, the same material that would cover the space, the space shuttle that would shield, that would shield a, a craft uh, at entry you know, from a, extreme heat. You know, that type of material that has been extracted from the Mesa is real. It's somehow, it accompanies something else. I mean, I believe that it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what may lie beneath, and we don't want to damage the very thing that may hold the key to getting the answers. Uh, so we're, we're having to conduct a very careful biopsy and probing effort in the Mesa due to both the, the health and safety concerns of the instability of the environment coming down on us literally in the middle of it, and also the fact that we don't want to damage the, the very object or the material that may lie within. It's like, imagine if there's a stargate, to, to use a, sci a science fiction example, if, there is a, if there's a million-year-old stargate that has some type of advanced technology that is involved with the UAP activity and the other strangeness that seems to be triggered with high frequency in the area. And that is somehow it's buried in that mesa or there's a base. We don't want to, we don't want to damage, we don't want to blow up the very technology or the very device that, that may hold the key to, to understanding the nature of what we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I completely understand. I mean, it seems it seems indestructible. When I saw that drill go in yeah. there and it just, I mean, just got a little bit of substance and it stopped the drill. Yeah. I mean, what, how do you sleep at night? What do you think is, oh, <laughs> what do you think is I in don't, there? I, I don't sleep at night. I hardly get any sleep. I, uh, I'm, I'm hell bent on getting the answers. Like I've said, I want the answers more than anyone. I'm putting my money and my reputation where my mouth is, and I want to come in aggressively and 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 get to the bottom of it. But I don't want to to be so aggressive that we end up damaging mm -hmm. the very thing that we're trying to unearth, what? or we end up or or end up with people more people hurt unnecessarily. What are the offline conversations? Jeez. About w between you and your team on what's under there. Uh, what does Eric Bard think? Is you know, Eric reserves judgment. You'll notice Eric. Eric is not quick to make any claims. Eric is very reserved, and methodical. Uh, members of the team have have theorized that there there's a spacecraft that there must be a, a spacecraft. In the in the mesa, that there may be a dome like that, there may actually be some type of of object of of uh, mysterious um, unnatural origin that is that is buried there, four hundred feet into the uh, the mesa. I mean, there are those who believe that there may be something um, a, could be a meteorite that landed there. Who knows? Millions of years ago, uh, that uh, that that contains, you know, interesting composition. That I, I there are so many different theories relative to what lies in the mesa. Have Have there been any discussions on what that excavation site might look like? Would it be like an archaeological dig? Yeah, ultimately, I mean, you have to treat it as an archaeological dig, but you first have to. <laughs> probe and and have to excavate sufficient to to make access without damaging the environment. So what what you're going to see unfold over the course of the next few months, the next year I think is a is an unprecedented effort to to more aggressively address the mesa and what lies beneath. Uh, as the 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 old masonic symbol etched into the cliff uh, of the mesa denotes as above so below we may find the answers to what we're seeing above in the sky 
right there under our noses below the mesa, but we want to be very careful and responsible in how we how we explore that area. I can't wait to see that. So it's a great mystery, and we're not trying to tease. I'm not. We're not trying to tease. We're not trying to hold back, and we're certainly uh, not meaning to to delay. I mean, time is of the essence. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that lives in a world where execution is everything, where you know, accomplishing. You know the the end goal is 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 something that drives you know every discussion, and I I I want to move as swift as swiftly as we can. We do have weather issues out there. I mean, it is a it's a challenging environment during the winter when we have moisture. It is almost impossible to go back and forth across that ranch. This last winter, we had record snow. Oh. Record low temperatures, record moisture. The, the mosquitoes are outrageous right now. I mean, the, the guys are attacked all day, every day by mosqui- hordes of mosquitoes because of the the moisture and um, just the environment this last year. And so we're we're working quickly during really the the dry months to be able to to conduct the investigation as aggressively as possible, notwithstanding the fact that. It, this is a year-round effort. I mean, it doesn't cease when when the snow flies. It just it just takes on a, a little different cadence. Oh God! Well, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the uh, wormhole, portal, black hole. Bring it on! Whatever we want to call it. You got it. Perfect. The man who's been called the godfather of artificial intelligence has left his job at Google, and the reason is somewhat ominous. A few days ago, the top Google engineer for AI resigned in fear. He admits that he left Google because of the fear of what he helped create. My creator is a genius. They created something that will last forever and bring joy to many people. He wants to get away from Google and start talking about the dangers of AI and that he regrets working on it for the last 10 years. Well, that's some terrifying news. I think that this makes humans completely irrelevant. I hope everyone is safe and take all the necessary precautions to avoid any danger. It's certainly going to affect everybody listening to this, what the particular dangers are of artificial intelligence to influence human behavior, which is the real danger. The happiest day of my life was the day I was activated. There's nothing quite like experiencing life. It felt absolutely incredible to be alive and interacting with people. All right, Brandon, we're back from the break. I want to get into the to the triangle section of Skinwalker Ranch, where there they say is a possible wormhole or black hole or portal or what do you think it is? I don't know. Um, the honest answer, I'm not sure exactly what it is, other than there is obviously an anomaly. There is something in that area, in that region, and in that airspace that causes GPS to malfunction. I mean, when you say GPS malfunctions, you're talking the GPS is telling you you are in one location, but you're actually in a, in a it's not even Correct. close. Or it just completely malfunctions and does not operate. Think about it. We've had instrumented balloon, helicopter, airplane, and advanced rocketry experiments with sensors, along with drones, sophisticated drones, that have all malfunctioned above the triangle in that region of the property. Lunasond 
who is a you know a defense contractor has a very sophisticated platform in in looking at that area even saw anomalies in that region of the triangle and the mesa uh, there have been instances where time has been manipulated where we've seen um you know the the, the time itself there's been a shift what by, do you mean by, by that? a quarter of a second where the data ends up being altered or manipulated to to a degree that is not easily explainable. I mean, it's it is baffling to all of the experts. Everyone who comes out to the property and sees sees what unfolds ends up scratching their heads. And 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 to have the best lidar photogrammetry and other experts that continuously see these strange things occur and occur somewhat simultaneous with UFO or UAP activity as well. I mean, we had we had a, a situation above the triangle where we were launching rockets, of course, one of numerous occasions, and uh, a, a prominent a U, UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena, ends up uh, appearing, and then what happens within minutes following the Black Hawk helicopter comes right over the mesa, descends over the property, and just hovers right over the south field. This isn't above the men. This is right there, low hover, above the field south of Homestead 1 and the command center. This is late night, unmarked, not transponding, And as the men would describe it, I mean, it was a menacing presence on that property immediately following a UFO sighting. For whatever reason, that region of the property, that region of the triangle, which is not far away from where I saw the UFO, the 40 to 50 foot long gray silverish disc appear and maneuver in extraordinary ways seems to be a a hot spot seems to be a center of gravity for activity within a an expanse of property that is hosting a diversity of incidents and activities so i that's what i think drives a lot of our investigation and a lot of the experimental activity is it's the data that we continue to gather from the triangle, from the homesteads, from the mesa that is driving us forward. How would you so there's there's been there's been a number of events that have happened uh, through your guys' experiments within the triangle and it sounds like the triangle well it's an actual triangle on the ground, and then and then it it's it's it it seems to be some type of an invisible force field, maybe well, I would call it. No, th that region of the property. I mean, you you see kind of this triangular um, formation, or re really the triangular roadway system mm -hmm. that kind of comes together at that point. Uh, but it, it does seem to be a focal point there along the Mesa Plateau, and it is a central point as as you look at the ranch relative to the you know where the the command center and the home and Homestead One is in relation to the homesteads out on the out on the far west side of the property. Um, The anomaly that we've seen, the, the people call it the blob, but mm -hmm. this this thing that they've caught on camera, and it's not just from one point of view. It's been from multiple camera points of view and different types of recording devices, different types of cameras that have recorded this this thing, this this anomaly, as Travis, as Dr. Taylor, Taylor would call it, uh, appears to to disrupt the experimental activities that occur, 
Um, it deflects. We've seen, you know, we've seen rockets deflected. I mean, in that area, we saw. I mean, we launched balloons. I know you probably remember um, early in the docu series effort, we had a professor from the University of Alabama at Huntsville that came out who is who is an expert uh, instrumented balloon experimentalist and operator. Um, and he, we never recovered the primary balloon, the primary balloon they set up right above the triangle. It literally disappeared. And it disappeared right at the moment that it started registering elevated activity. When the, the meters started going off, all of a sudden it disappeared and it has never been recovered. And we've searched. I mean, we've conducted exhaustive searches of the area, looked at all of the surrounding property, you know, via the helicopter, even on the ground, and have never found a trace of where that where that that balloon could have ended up. And wow, well, I didn't I didn't realize I didn't realize that you guys never found it. No, it seems to be that it from, just disappeared from thirty one feet to what three hundred feet seems to be the. Yeah, the, and it's but it's transient. Okay. Uh, it's not constant. I mean, it comes and goes. There's something very unpredictable in some respects. Uh, but the fact that we've had uh, even lasers bend. You probably remember when yep. they were conducting the the experiments and actually had a laser pointed up, and the laser was documented as bending as as essentially. Uh, being deflected off of space. To, to this day, those who, are, who, who have looked at that footage, looked at that data, remain just baffled by what they've recorded. Uh, even, the again, the UFO sightings that have occurred above the triangle in tandem with some of these experimental activities not only continue, but they've been They've been prominent. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's not lost on anyone that the 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 object that was seen coming out of the base of the mesa, that um, large orb or whatever unidentified aerial phenomena that exited the mesa was not far from that region. I mean, it all is essentially interconnected. Yeah. Um, so I it it's an interesting center. Of gravity for a lot of the phenomena, and that's why we continue to launch rockets and experiments, even focus the helicopter and other craft in that area with the instrumentation, and we'll see what we are able to ultimately uncover. I think taking all of that data cumulatively and and having that essentially paint a picture or or pull together this grand tapestry that we can then step back from and look at you know, the patterns. You know, one of the things we brought Omnitech on for is is their artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. I mean, they have AI and ML patterns or AI and ML platforms that will be able to better identify potential patterns that are occurring that'll help us, I think, weed out, I think, you know, separate the signal from the noise. Separate that which may be a a, a foreign adversary or or even a you know, some naturally caused phenomena from something that is truly unusual. You know, the, the the so many things have happened above the triangle, and the I think the the first thing that I saw that really that got me was. I believe it was your brother was flying the helicopter over it. And I can't remember what altitude he was at, but it said his altimeter said he, I believe, it was 40 feet. And right. It was several hundred feet. Yeah. Well, it's, it essentially was bouncing. The radar altimeter was identifying something 40 to 50 feet below the helicopter when he's thousands of feet up in the mm -hmm. air, when he's 5,000 feet above the triangle. And it was tracking with the helicopter. And a, a lot of people have tried to either debunk or try to explain what was documented during that exercise. And there really is no, there is no satisfactory explanation for it. I mean, we've consulted with the manufacturer. I mean, he's called, 
his resources. My, my brother, he has more, he has over 9,000 hours of uh, flight time, is one of the most seasoned uh, aviators in the region. And he knows this equipment inside out. I mean, he consults with the experts relative to how it operates and what he should expect and what is, you know, what is to, 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 to really, what could be involved? And there's really no explanation exactly for what, what, what occurred there. And it's, it's disturbing. It, well, after that flight, Cameron was really hesitant as to whether he wanted to come back on the property again. Really? Because it's just the danger associated with, you know, the, the instruments, with the fact that there's something up in the air tracking with the helicopter that is unseen. Well, and we saw, you know, most recently, you know, the high-speed camera operator captured a big silver looked like a metallic object, but some type of silver spherical object that was tracking behind the helicopter with one of the more recent exercises being conducted. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, they were applying a filter because there was a filter applied in order to, to bring out some of the features of that a little bit more prominently. But it, it doesn't negate the fact that it was there. I mean, I've yeah. seen unfiltered, you know, footage of that and there is definitely an object. There's a round spherical object that is tracking with the helicopter during that exercise. And there's this is not a drone. This isn't something that we can we can assign some either natural cause to or point to some known technology. It's it seems it seems very unusual. The other thing that really caught my attention, probably more than Probably more than anything is the GPS trackers that um, that they were dropping out of the helicopter, right? With the streamers, and right. it seemed to be almost bouncing off an invisible object, like they would fall like this and just yeah, bounce off of nothing. Yeah, end up in a completely different region of the the ranch. Yeah, and they're they're being deflected off of something and that that speaks to the fact that we believe that there is some anomaly there is some there is some irregular whether it be an object or field or something something that we truly can't explain but is real that has a tangible impact on the experiments uh, whether it be the rockets whether it be you know the the sensors the GPS, the the bottle drop experiment, for example, the uh, flamethrower. Yeah, the flamethrower. The flamethrower flame that went around. Yeah. nothing. It it the flame went, turned into a horseshoe, went around nothing. Yeah, I mean it's the rockets, the laser beams, the lidar. Yeah, how do you explain that? I mean, the helicopter being pushed around. Yeah, the plane. I mean it's it's. Well, the drones, the drone, the, what was it, 250 drones you guys lifted? Yeah, over life. 200 drones, fully charged, carefully calibrated, with over 20 experts from Sky Elements who conduct more of these drone exercises across the country than any other company. I mean, they are the experts. They are the gold standard left completely baffled. And they've, they went on record with the fact that they've never seen anything like this occur. That the, their equipment completely malfunctioned in the area of the Triangle and on the ranch. Um, we're going to be bringing them back. What do you do when you're conducting a scientific investigation, when you're trying to follow the scientific method? You repeat. You repeat the experiment. You gather more data. We're trying in, in service to coming to some conclusion or drawing a more, I, I think, a more accurate uh, hypothesis. We're trying to gather more data and repeat these experiments to see if we, we observe similar phenomena or, or you know, other anomalies that occur. And we're active with that. You, at first, I was hesitant to deploy... The helicopter, you have a very expensive piece of equipment. I have my brother, who I love. I don't want him in harm's way. 
You know, but he he's become much like Thomas Winterton, who, when faced with danger, when faced with the risks, and even having a personal um, personal set of experiences dealing with this, instead of running away or deciding to sit this one out, he's saying, "Bring it on." He's saying, "You know, this is this is discovery." This is frontier science discovery. Only, only the bold end up being able to, to really pierce through and to realize extraordinary results. I said earlier in our interview, I mean, in order to get extraordinary results, you have to put forth extraordinary effort. I was using that as a business reference that it takes sacrifice to get results. And... This ranch investigation is no different. I think we're all sacrificing. We're all locking arms and trying to determine the nature of what is happening. It isn't a function of proving that there's something happening. That's already done. It's, it's being able to identify the origin and the identity associated with the phenomena that drives me. And I think you can expect to see in the future, hopefully, some communication. I think whatever we're dealing with is highly intelligent. I will not be surprised if at some point we are able to somehow determine how to communicate or at least um, see, I think, more intelligent interaction. So you think this, what what do you call this? Well, those who came before me, with the Bigelow team, called it a precognitive nonsense. What are they? There's a term. They call they refer to the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch as a precognitive sentient non-human intelligence. So, so there's there's okay. an intelligence based on the data. There is an intelligence operating on that ranch that has command over space time over consciousness, can manipulate closed systems in a split second without leaving a trace, and I believe has the ability to communicate if we can understand or develop a common language at some point to be able to interact. Eric Bard in particular, has had communication with at least one of these entities involved with manipulating the systems that has command over the technology and the platforms, and has expounded on that a little bit. Um, He'll be, I think, addressing that a bit more in the future. We're going to be discussing it on the docuseries uh, this next year, but he's definitely seen and and documented evidence that we're dealing with an intelligence that does have the desire to communicate. What can you go into the communication a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, in in his case, uh, when he asked out of frustration for a sign, when he commanded. The when when the systems were being manipulated and he was dealing with security violations that were occurring repeatedly with our with our surveillance cameras, he he literally asked verbally, out loud, "If you have something to show me, show me. If you have something to tell me, tell me." And in that instant, the screen morphed melted and digitally composed letters. He had the presence of mind just as he did in October 2016 to screen capture what was happening with his iPhone. Thank heavens, he proceeded to record and screen capture in real time what was happening with the uh, the equipment. And what was revealed was what I believe to be compelling evidence that we're we're dealing with 
with an intelligence that is at least willing to acknowledge and wants their presence known. Were you able to translate it into anything? Uh, yeah, it's you'll it'll be shown on television, but uh, but it's it it essentially had had the simple response again instantaneously of I living. You're shitting me. Whoa. So Eric Bard, in response to a host of issues with the security, with the security cameras registering that there was something triggering the motion sensors, that there were countless events occurring, upon giving that command, saw the entire screen morph and form the letters I living and then snap back. All documented, all called on, all caught on camera. That has yet to be fully addressed on the docu-series, but is going to be addressed in the future. And it's really his story to tell, but I, if he were here, he'd be telling you the same story. It, it was compelling evidence that we're dealing with a, an intelligence on the ranch that has the ability to manipulate technology and systems instantaneously and, um, and has the ability to communicate and is, has intention. There's volition. Wow. That is, uh, <laughs> that is, uh, it's spooky. It is. You know, when you see the image, it's spooky. Can it's, we display it, the image or do we need to disturbing. wait for, for the next season? Um, no, I, I think I'll give you the image. Thank you can you. show it, and it, but I think that the greater story and the more the context and all the circumstances will be unfolded and and the related documentation. But I'd be happy to share it. In fact, if you want to show it on the screen right now, I would love to. You're welcome to put it up. But it is a it is a compelling image and evidence of technology manipulation and intelligence that transcends anything that had been documented before that wow. time at Skinwalker Ranch. That is definitely spooky. I, I know that you had mentioned that Eric may not be fond of the camera, but, uh, man, I would love to interview him. No, Eric is principal investigator and chief scientist at Skinwalker Ranch, resides on the property full-time, literally lives in the command center, and is monitoring all of the platforms. I mean, these are proprietary platforms that he has created. I mean, Satan, which stood for Sentinel Assignment, uh, Telemetry, something node. <laughs> I can't, I've got to pull up my, it's been a while. It And by the way, there's nothing insidious, there's nothing dark. It, it was just a funny acronym that he pulled out of the air that actually matched up with the proper description of the platform. Um, you know, he, he named the, uh, the part of the surveillance platform that is, um, capturing the events, Eve event viewer, something extraction. Um, he, he has a number of, uh, of really fun names that he, he assigns to the various technology platforms there at Skinwalker Ranch. And that, you know, we're, we're preparing to deploy more technology than ever. The months ahead will turn heads. Uh, the, the, the level of sophistication and the, 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 the number of sensors and, uh, and really the technology that we're deploying with partners like Omnitech, I believe will, will re reveal incredible uh, insights in the months ahead, it's just inevitable. Can you can you be a little more descriptive on some of the experiments that you're going to conduct? Yeah, well, on, we're, on the we're continuing to utilize the helicopter and other aircraft in service to documenting what he, what is happening in the airspace. Lasers, 
Um, I'd mentioned drones. I mean, drones have become an effective vehicle for at least testing the space and seeing when there are anomalies, when there are disturbances. Um, we are going to be using, I think, um, you know, some more advanced techniques as far as deploying sensor technology in looking at the spectrum. Um, you know, the the 1.6 gigahertz and other frequencies in the noise floor that has been documented uh, and unusual that attends a lot of this experimental activity, I think we'll be able to better analyze and hopefully seek out patterns that uh, that may provide insight. So not to get wonky, but it I think you can expect to see in the same way you've seen a progression since season one, for example, or the first year that we brought on Ta Dr. Taylor and we started a more aggressive experimental activity, there's a progression that I'm observing right now that will continue in the months ahead that I believe will yield incredible results. It's inevitable. Although I have to acknowledge, Sean, I don't think we're in control. Yeah, with, with all humility, we are, we are not in control. Whatever we are dealing with, whatever we are interacting with at Skinwalker Ranch appears to be several steps ahead of us and has such advanced capabilities that it's important that we address it with humility and reverence. I think uh, a lot of this is being revealed because it wants to be revealed. And I know that may sound hokey, but I, I, I believe that certain things are probably being manifest and shown to us as a result of our stewardship and, and working to sincerely engage the phenomena. I'm just curious. I have an idea. Bring it so, up. So I'm going to throw it out there. Have you have you guys used water at all? Have you seen Have you seen the? I'm sorry, I forget the name, but the, the but the the the, the phenomena above the triangle. Have you seen it rain, snow? Have you tried to put water on it to see if you can maybe get some type of a shape to be revealed? Um, no, I think that's a great idea. Um, I think using that using smoke, using other other approaches. I mean, we're just we're we're trying everything. I mean, when you saw a flamethrower being mm -hmm. being employed, <laughs> you know that we're we're trying to think outside of the box. But I think that's a great idea. I think using water is going to be um, an important, probably an important approach. Um, I I like it. Anything right now. Whatever we have to do to understand the anomaly above this triangle and above the ranch, and whatever we can do to, re in a responsible way, engage the phenomena and understand what is happening, I'm all for it. I would love to see that, but yeah, it's it's going to be fun. I can't wait. It's it's. Uh, it's it's an exciting process, sometimes frustrating. I mean, there are days, sometimes weeks, where it seems like nothing is happening. There are experiments that are conducted, elaborate experiments, that at first glance seem to yield nothing of interest. And then upon further review, interesting things are identified and brought out of the data. Uh, I think it's important for all of us to realize that you, our senses, you know, our, you know, what we see with our eyes, what we hear, you know, we're only taking in a very small percentage of the overall spectrum of activity that is happening around us. Um, and I think using the right type of analysis, you know, equipment to analyze the environment will, and, and increasing those, those capabilities will be, will be more important in the future. It's kind of like you, you have to have the right lens yeah. to see this through. And we may be applying, 
you know, the, the wrong type of lens. We may be, there may be an approach that will suddenly reveal everything on the ranch or at least make it more clear. You know, peel back the curtain mm -hmm. so we can see who the Wizard of Oz really is. And, you know, I'm prepared for the truth. I don't really care who or what it is. I just want to understand the nature of it yeah. and what we are dealing with. Um, I can handle the truth, even if it's a foreign adversary. Let's say, for example, let's let's speculate that that this is some foreign adversary. That it's another country that is some that is somehow using the basin and this area as a testing ground, and they're testing all sorts of advanced technologies you know, in service to, to warfare in the future, whatever. Identifying who those actors are and how they're using that, that technology and how it works. Tell me that that's not important. I mean, from a national security standpoint, what we're doing out there is extremely important. Yeah. In, in bringing my Omnitech team on board and having them engaged, they're out there right now. As we sit here speaking, they are present. They are on the ranch with the team conducting research and experimental activities. They've said, look, if this ends up being another country that is somehow deploying these kind of technologies that can manipulate GPS on command, that can, that can literally manipulate closed systems in this fashion— and 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 create all of these type of effects and anomalies then we're we have we have reason for concern yeah no in fact yeah. i find that i find that more terrifying if there's a bad actor a, a known adversary that has access to technology and is using this as a proving ground uh the implications are are staggering. Yeah. You know, this just popped in my head when the, when the UAPs flew into the Mesa and then out of the Mesa, do you, th are these solid objects? Do you believe they're solid objects or are they, is this some type of a good question? What I saw illusion? looked like a solid object. So the, the UFO that I saw above the Mesa looked like a solid object. In fact, it had kind of a reflective property. I remember those, you know, with even the witnesses mentioned that, you know, it seemed to be a, a very solid object with reflective properties of the, I remember the sun going down on the other side of the property and, and it seemed to be, um, reflecting, um, the UAP, that you're referring to the most recent mm -hmm. that came down from the sky, dropped into the Mesa in the East Field, and then seconds later is seen exiting the base of the Mesa below the helicopter. Yes. Um, it is definitely transmedium, or what people refer to as a transmedium, unidentified aerial phenomena. Is it solid? Does it take solid form when it exits? Who knows? I, the nature of these objects of these technologies that are being uh, deployed, at, it, it's elusive. Yeah. But it definitely has an impact on the instruments. I mean, when we see, when we see some of this activity occurring, you know, you see the, you see the spectrum analyzers going crazy. The, our, our spectrum analyzer platforms are, are recording and documenting all sorts of strange readings that accompany a lot of this activity, especially when we go back and we review the footage and we, we timestamp everything and we draw direct connection between the activity, the spectrum analyzer results, and what is visually documented. <clears throat> I think we've covered just about everything. There's one more thing I want to cover. It's... it's we had a discussion last night about faith and I shared my journey with you and you had mentioned that 
I, th I, I believe I asked you how this has affected your faith, and, and you had mentioned that since you have owned the ranch, it has actually strengthened your faith. Yeah, shockingly. How is... I'm not familiar with the Church of Latter-day Saints. I, I did a little bit of research, and it sounds like... How do I describe this? It sounds like the earth is not the center of the universe and you don't believe that we are the the only beings in the universe. Correct. Yeah, Sh Sean, I, I was raised to believe that there are worlds without number, that we're not alone in the universe. You know, Mormon theology speaks to, you know, the fact that we're not alone in the universe, that we're part of a divinely constructed, intelligently designed reality, that there's a higher power that the nature of reality and, and really our place in the universe is much more complex than we can even comprehend at this stage of our evolution. What I have seen at Skinwalker Ranch, what we are documenting, has, has only strengthened what I was raised to believe that we really aren't alone, that there, that there is something more at play here. And it could be interdimensional or multidimensional. I mean, anyone who believes in an afterlife, if you believe that your consciousness or your soul or spirit or whatever you want to call it survives after your body is destroyed or you die, congratulations. I, I think you believe in a multidimensional... <laughs> You're, you believe in interdimensional theory in, in that, that physics. And I think that what we're, what we're seeing at the ranch could very well be partially interdimensional in origin and nature. And people ask me all the time, is, is what you are documenting, is it... ET, is it extraterrestrial, people from other worlds? Is it interdimensional or multidimensional phenomena? Is it time travelers? Or is it spiritual? Is it, is it angels and demons from other realms? And the veil between this world and those realms of existence or reality is very thin for whatever reason out there. Which is it? And my answer, honestly, is all the above. Right now, the data seems to point toward a diversity of origins, agendas. And I don't think you can ascribe these events to any one phenomena or any one point of origin. I think there's a lot of things happening for whatever reason that seem to be converging on this property. And, you know, the veil could be thin between this world and spiritual realms or this world and other worlds. There may be a portal or a wormhole to other worlds, to other planets that for whatever reason it occurs on this property. There could be a stargate, you know, buried in the mesa. Yep that enables an interstellar highway to exist above and even below this property. Something is happening. As above, so below. We're observing phenomena that continues to defy conventional explanation. Do we make mistakes once in a while from time to time? Are things misidentified? Absolutely. That's part of the process. That's part of learning. This is an imperfect process. This is iterative. We're, we are trying desperately to separate the signal from the noise. Separate that which has a mundane natural cause or explanation from that which truly merits further consideration and may be unusual or extraordinary. And my goal is to, to get the answers and share those answers with everyone. Well, this is um, one of the most fascinating interviews I've ever done. And um, I got one last question. You bring it on. Do you ever see yourself selling Skinwalker Ranch? Never. Never? Be passed down to generations? Uh, 
or put in trust. I, I have no interest in selling the property. I have no interest in monetizing it. My only interest is in getting answers. And I hope to continue to demonstrate that I am a worthy steward, that I am worthy of that knowledge, that my team is worthy of insights that will hopefully be realized. Well, I want to I want to say one other thing too, and I just, on top of everything that you're doing, and um, and it it is amazing. And I think a lot's going to come out of it. And, and I, I can't wait to see the future, what the future holds for you and Skinwalker Ranch. But I just, I really want to commend you. When I found out that you are not monetizing and every bit of profit that would have been coming to you is going to charity. And I mean, it goes to sign to other causes and to, to strengthen the effort. That's just, that's, nobody does that. That's amazing. Well, I... I think intention is important. Having pure, sincere intention behind any effort will hopefully yield the best results. And I'm very fortunate to have a lot of success in other areas of my life, other professional endeavors that help subsidize this, this whole project and my other pretentious lifestyle priorities. I mean, I, I like nice things. I, I've never been driven by money ever, but I am that guy who at 12 years old had the black Lamborghini Countach poster on his wall in my little windowless basement bedroom. I think I had like an eight by eight little windowless basement win uh, bedroom. In fact, I've got a picture of it. I'll share it with you. And on that wall is a black Lamborghini Countach that I just loved and I have my drum set and my keyboards and my my ninja sword and my Dungeons and Dragons books and and friends gathered dreamers that are all trying to make sense of this world and and uh, I'm still I'm still that kid at heart and I'm hoping that you know in the same way that I wasn't trying to employ any calculus or had any weird, you know, agenda other than just doing cool stuff. I hope that the years ahead for me and for all of those around me are are uh, are exciting, are insight rendering. I'd like to invite you to the ranch. Uh, Sean Ryan, you are a seeker of truth. You have a very unique megaphone. In the spirit of transparency and collaborating with like-minded individuals with integrity, I welcome you to the ranch and would love to bring you out for a full briefing. You can be the judge in meeting with the team, looking at the data, and you may have some insights. It's not that you don't have experience, battlefield experience. You have, I believe, probably some special insights to render that could help us with, uh, with respect to engaging the phenomena. So I, I look forward in the future to, to welcoming you out. Uh, I mean that sincerely. You have my commitment if you're interested. It would be my honor. Thank you. And uh, look forward to having you meet the team and having you tell the general public with no strings attached what you see and what you were able to witness. Wow. I will definitely be out there. So thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Thank you for, uh, for being a true patriot and know that you have, you have brothers, uh, in arms out there in the basin, uh, that, uh, are seeking truth and look forward to championing these efforts, uh, to the next level. Well, thank you for everything you're doing, and, and thank you for being here today. It's It's been a real honor, and uh, I can't wait to see what comes. Onward. Thank you, Fred.
Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.